Bwri da, a rhoeso cynnes iawn i bob un ohonoch chi i gyfarfod y uh, ein bwrdd iechyd y uh, bore yma. Cyfarfod uh, fel y gwyddoch chi sydd yn cael ei darlledu yn fyw ac mi ddydd na recordiad o'r cyfarfod ar gael uh, ar ôl y cyfarfod heddiw er mwyn i bobl wylio uh, y, y cyfarfod uh, sydd ddim yn gallu, sydd ddim yn medru bod gyda ni y bore yma. Felly hyfryd i weld pob un ohonoch chi. Cael cwpra dwi cadeirydd y bwrdd ac fe welwch chi ar y sgrin manylion ynghylch uh, pobl eraill fydd yn cymryd rhan yn y cyfarfod yma er mwyn i chi gael wybod uh, pwy yn union ydy pwy. It's a great pleasure this morning to welcome each and every one of you to this uh, meeting of uh, the board of Powys Teaching Health Board. Um, we are, of course, uh, a, a, a virtual meeting. It's being um, uh, um, it's being broadcast live and a recording of the meeting will be available um, after today's event so that people can uh, uh, watch and people can catch up on our business uh, after after today. My name is Carl Cooper. I'm the chair of the board. And as we go through the meeting, you will see details on screen as to who other participants are. Just a word of explanation initially, um, we are experiencing some technical difficulties across the NHS today, which may affect uh, connectivity and the Teams platform that we're using. Um, we're hoping that that doesn't happen, but uh, if it does, uh, then we'll manage that uh, if, if necessary. Um, and just another um, uh, introductory uh, observation, um, people will be very, very aware that um, uh, health services and the NHS is extremely uh, busy at the moment and pressurised. And therefore, uh, we've decided to um, keep the agenda today as focused as we can. And therefore, there are some items of business that uh, ordinarily would have appeared on today's agenda that we have um, uh, postponed until future meetings. For example, uh, the digital strategic framework that we're still committed to, um, but we haven't brought to this agenda uh, because of pressure of business. Um, but just with those introductory comments, let's move to the agenda first and foremost. Um, uh, in welcoming everyone, I particularly want to welcome uh, Helen Bushell, um, our new Director of Corporate Governance and Board Secretary. Uh, it's been uh, uh, wonderful to be able to, to meet with Helen over the last couple of weeks, and uh, I'm sure that we're all looking forward to uh, her contribution to our, our common endeavours. So, And also to Councillor Chris Walsh, um, uh, the new independent member uh, with a local authority background. Uh, wonderful to have you with us, Chris. And uh, again, look, look forward very, very much to working with you. We haven't received any apologies. Dim am the hiriade am absenolder, am absenolder, ar gyfer y cyfarfod yma heddiw. Um, uh, ac felly fe sumidw ni ymlaen at pwy, at, um, uh, uh, at, in point dai, save that's get that's gonna get dai or vidyanai. Are there any declarations of interest um, in relation to any item on the agenda that anyone would like to make? No. So there are no declarations of interest. We move to the um, minutes of our previous meeting initially for accuracy. Uh, oes na unrhyw uh, newidiadau neu welliau neu arfaithedig mae bobl am awgrymu. Uh, are there any corrections, uh, uh, suggested amendments that anyone uh, would like to recommend? If not, we um, accept those as a correct record of our last meeting. You will see at the end of those meetings that there is a brief summary of the in-committee session that happened at the end of, uh, of, of the last meeting um, uh, for, for the public record. Uh, we will be holding uh, another very brief in-committee session uh, after this 
public uh, after this meeting in public uh, just to um, accept and sign off those detailed minutes of that section of our conversation. And so we go now to the board action log um, item 1.5 on the agenda. There is only one uh, action uh, on that log and that is, that relates to um, including the full cost of delayed transfers of care in future financial reports. Um, this action is actually being passed, if you like, to the Delivery and Performance Committee. So that information will be provided to and through the Delivery Performance Committee um, uh, and, and will, be, uh, will be progressed, if you like, in that way. Um, are there any other um, matters arising from the last minutes that anyone would like to raise that don't get dealt with elsewhere on our agenda today? No, in which case we move to point uh, 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 agenda 1.6 and um, our patient experience story. And Claire Madsen, our Director of Therapies and Health Sciences, is going to lead us through this. So thank you, Claire. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Carl, very much for that. Um, so today's story is from one of our patients who's requested to remain anonymous. So I'm going to be reading the story for her today. And I'd really like to thank her for raising this important issue as so many people find this subject so difficult to talk about and for the opportunity to raise the profile of this and similar conditions and to encourage others to come forwards. So we've put the patient's story in writing here, but I will read it to you. So I began to feel symptoms of a prolapsed uterus in 2021. It felt like something was pushing down and although nothing was actually protruding, it was uncomfortable and I experienced pain at various levels throughout the day. Mild pain in the morning, increasing to severe pain in the late afternoon and evening. The pain would also affect my sleep. There are often times when I would have to sit down to relieve the pain. It affected just about everything I did and I had to reduce or stop most activities that I enjoyed. And so I was feeling increasingly depressed. My GP confirmed that I had a prolapsed uterus and referred me to a gynaecologist. I waited what seemed like a long time for this appointment. The gynaecologist advised me that my uterus was healthy. Unfortunately, I was not experiencing any form of incontinence. We discussed various treatments and procedures and she suggested that I do a lot of pelvic floor exercises. I did not want hormone treatment or vaginal pessaries, which was suggested by the gynaecologist but I'm grateful to her for offering me physiotherapy. The NHS webpage, Pelvic Organ Prolapse, does not mention physiotherapy and I had no idea it was an option. I wanted a better understanding of what was going on with my body. I waited what felt like a long time for this appointment and all the while doing regular pelvic floor exercises throughout the day. At this time, I felt like the pain was getting worse, but nevertheless, I persevered. I should mention that in my personal life, I was under a great deal of stress, both physical and mental, because of family health issues. I eventually had a telephone appointment with Miriam Evans, physiotherapist, and this felt like a real turning point for me. I started the recommended exercises and breathing techniques immediately. By the time I saw her face to face, I was already pain free and the discomfort had eased considerably. My life is now back to normal. I'm pain free and the discomfort continues to improve. I can enjoy all the activities I used to do before. I'll be continuing with the exercises and breathing techniques to ensure that I can maintain my pelvic health and avoid any unnecessary procedures in the future. I would highly recommend this physiotherapy to everyone and wish it was more readily available. It provides a greater understanding of physical health, prevents unnecessary pain, discomfort and invasive treatments. So we really wanted next, we really wanted to raise this issue because it's important to highlight these issues and talk about them. So I'd really like to thank this uh, patient for bringing this item to us. It's estimated that seven million people in the UK have incontinence, but fewer than half actually seek help. 
Prolapse prevalence is thought to be three to six percent of the population that we know about. And it's also mm -hmm. interesting to know that pelvic floor problems affect both men and women. However, the worrying statistic is that it's estimated that fewer than half seek help as they're too embarrassed to discuss or admit they have a problem. So many people are suffering in silence. Many people actually don't realise there's very effective treatments that can be given to help with these conditions. So I really like to thank our patient for coming forward and raising this issue. And I've just added a link here if anyone who's listening is worried about this condition where they can find information about things they can do to help themselves. And I would encourage them to come forwards because as clinicians, we're very used to talking about these subjects and we really wouldn't want anyone to feel embarrassed or worried about raising them. So thank you very much uh, to our patient for raising this story and I'm happy to answer any questions or take any comments. Thank you, Claire. Uh, would anyone like to come in at this point with any observations or questions or comments? No, so uh, thank you, Claire. And uh, uh, sorry, Carol, please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Sorry, sorry, Chair. I'm just navigating the hands and all of that sort of thing. Um, uh, to, to thank Claire and to thank the patient for coming forward. It, it, Claire talks about stigma, but um, we know that these issues uh, affect um, a, a significant number of people in our communities, in our population and amongst staff as well, actually, in, in the NHS. And the more we talk about and discuss some of these really challenging things that um, could be preventing people from full employment or full enjoyment and fulfillment of their lives. You know, we won't be uh, tackling this unless we have these conversations. Uh, I just wanted to draw attention to um, the, in, uh, the, uh, the intent and the work that's going on on the Women's Health Plan uh, in Wales in the NHS. So uh, very recently, uh, the discovery phase of the work on the Women's Health Plan was completed uh, as uh, the NHS Leadership Board. We uh, looked at that. I'm uh, the Chief Exec Lead for, for Women's Health and so we're now working on the design for um, how, how services and how approaches should be taken forward based on the views of women. And I, I've got to say we were absolutely overwhelmed by the response of women to um, uh, the surveys that were put out of the focus groups and um, you know there are a wide uh, range of issues that do um, affect and in, uh, felt to impede women uh, in terms of their health and well-being. So uh, just to say thank you to Claire but we will be looking during the coming months to uh, draw together some of the actions that we would be looking to take locally to continue to improve uh, access to uh, for women uh, to, um, to to healthcare. So um, thanks, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Claire. No, thank you. Um, uh, and just to reiterate that uh, uh, from a board perspective, these these patient stories are hugely uh, helpful. They, um, you know, we read lots of reports, we look at lots of data, we, uh, but actually. Uh, hearing the voice of uh, people um, uh, brings it to life and, uh, uh, and makes it real. Uh, so uh, much, much appreciated. Um, uh, so we move on to the updates from initially uh, myself and then Kirsty and then Carol. Um, I'll take these one by one. Um, I'll invite any additional comments and then any observations or questions. Um, uh, I'll take my report as read. Uh, I don't have any additional comments to make, but I am happy to uh, uh, take questions or comments from anyone. Um, are there any? Uh, yes, Robert, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. You make a reference under the heading PTHB in Powers County Council to the Joint Rapid Escalation Plan. Um, I was interested to know, and, and I don't know whether you would answer this or maybe Carol as part of her report later, what is it? This plan, when will it be implemented? What will be the impact and the timescales? And perhaps why we haven't done it before? Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, uh, I, 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 r rather than have two stabs at, the, at, the, at that answer, um, uh, can I suggest that 
uh, that Carol, you could pick it up uh, when we come to your uh, uh, to your update. Is is that okay? Um, thank you. Yeah. Are, are there any other questions or comments? If not, um, but perhaps just before we move on, just to say that from a chair perspective, you know, I, as I said in my report, um, really welcome those conversations with the local authority um, uh, and. Uh, uh, things are pretty tough at the moment and the fact that uh, we are seeking uh, uh, to work together in close partnership is is absolutely essential and so crucial uh, and uh, but Carol will pick up the detail of uh, of the plan and its implementation um, so moving to Kirsty any additional comments Kirsty uh, no chair no additional comments uh, the report just contains um, some highlights of my activities since the last board meeting happy to take any questions. Any questions or comments for Kirsty? No, so thank you. And so we move to Carol's report. Again, additional comments, Carol? Um, not, not really, Chair. We've got a number of um, items on the agenda that I refer to just in the overarching um, uh, report uh, here. Um, uh, so, so nothing specific, although if I can just um, draw people's attention to the engagement activity that's going on. So there is quite a lot of activity at the moment seeking the views of members of the public. So uh, if anyone is watching the board and they have particular views on cochlear implant and bone conduction hearing, uh, the Belmont surgery in Gilwern or the air ambulance uh, services, there's uh, items uh, in my report about all of those. So I just would like to raise awareness on that. Um, and then also just to congratulate the workforce uh, team uh, on their being shortlisted for an award and to Dr Andy Rainsford for his King's New Year's Honours recognition. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we have the question from Robert and I know that Ronnie wants to come in with another question. So perhaps you take Robert's question initially, Carol, would you on the rapid, rapid escalation plan? Yes, thanks. Thanks very much. We we will, Robert, be covering a bit more of that in the winter plan report. But um, I think suffice to say that, um, as the chair has just indicated, it's been an extremely difficult period. Um, uh, people will have not uh, missed through the media the multiple reports of the pressures across the health and social care system. Um, and only yesterday, the report of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the commission that has been set up focuses on social care. So the rapid escalated action uh, uh, plan has been developed as a way of uh, the health board and the local authority to work together on those interface issues and those uh, social and community care issues. Uh, we will touch on it a little bit more detail, uh, Robert, in the winter plan uh, uh, update, but largely it covers issues such as uh, assessment processes, uh, community capacity, so how we help people to get home and how we help people to stay at home, um, uh, flow and coordination of the complex journeys that patients have into district general hospitals and then back in into Powys. Um, and also then uh, how we build um, more, more integrated and joined up uh, working uh, and navigation for uh, for care. So they're the, the key four areas uh, just in terms of um, uh, taking this work forward. It is part of the commitment that we made as a board when we met with the cabinet back in, I think it was September now, uh, to look uh, to work more closely together. And this is the key and pressing uh, area to, to do so. But um, uh, Hayley and other colleagues who are uh, knee deep in this work will give us a bit more of a flavour when we get to the uh, winter plan item, uh, Chair and Robert, if that's OK. Thank you. Uh, Robert, so I won't come back to you now, um, but the, the, there may be when we get to the winter plan, uh, of course, you, you, you may, uh, if you have any additional questions or uh, want to come back on that, then uh, uh, certainly do so. Uh, Ronnie, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Carol, you've touched on some of this slightly already, but I'm conscious of the fact that we're now in 2023 
And in this year, NHSE, NHSD and HEE will reduce their strapping structures by some 40%. And in addition, there is now a Patricia Hewitt review of the integrated care systems in England. So um, I'm just seeking assurance that we're satisfied that our relationships with neighbouring English trusts are robust and uh, particularly against the development of our IMTP. That's the first question. And the second one, very quickly, is we haven't referenced uh, displaced Ukrainian citizens for some time. And some of them are now approaching or have approached the end of their time with host families. So I'm just seeking assurance that we're continuing to support them in terms of health board responsibilities as they continue to navigate an uncertain path in our culture. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ronnie. Um, uh, I will look to Mez to perhaps comment on uh, the position with Ukrainian uh, refugees as, as she's uh, much uh, more close to that than, than I am. However, I do know that uh, there is continuing work to, as you quite rightly say, support the health and wellbeing needs of, of people from Ukraine. On the English system, there's a couple of things, absolutely. So um, uh, Patricia Hewitt is um, undertaking a review of, of ICSs. It's interesting timing because the integrated care systems and integrated care boards are still relatively new. Um, so I'm sure there'd be uh, some commentary about them, them bedding down and some will have moved more quickly than others. Uh, what we do have in place, uh, Ronnie, is a cross-border group um, that uh, uh, is, um, and we, we play a big role in, in that. Um, so it's got government, uh, Welsh government and um, uh, UK government uh, officials there. Uh, uh, it's also got senior colleagues from the NHS. Uh, we've got a meeting coming up um, and some of the particular focus has been the implementation of the Health and, and Care Act in England and the implications of cross-border relationships. Um, and just yesterday we considered um, uh, the, 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 the a paper at the NHS Wales Leadership Board that looked at the differences in the legislation and where that might cause us um, um, difference or friction or disadvantage potentially. So that those issues are very well cited. Um, we've got good working relations in the cross-border group. Um, in fact, we're all grappling with the same challenges, to be quite frank with you, when we talk about demands and workforce and the financial envelope that's available to us. So it does feel in, in, in many respects as, as if it's one NHS, even though there's devolved government and different policies in place. So I am confident we've got good mechanisms uh, across the border there. We're giving them extra care and attention during the implementation of the care, uh, Health and Care Act. Um, and we are linking with our main partners in relation to um, integrated medium term planning. Uh, just this last week, we had a report go to the um, uh, Population Health Planning and Partnerships Committee about strategic change. So we have a strong dialogue with colleagues in other organisations. And I look forward to seeing uh, Patricia Hewitt's report. I understand she has issued a report to government, an interim report, uh, but I, uh, I must have not been able to find it. So um, uh, when it becomes available, I will have a look at that to see if there's anything further for us. Uh, I hope that's helpful, uh, Ronnie. If I bring Mez in, if, if you do want to come back, but Mez on, on the Ukrainian refugees. Thank you, um, Dialch. Yeah. So in terms of the um, Ukrainian refugees, yeah, we work closely with the, the local authority for um, families that were in welcome centres. The House Board um, carried out or offered all the house screening checks, and there were families um, or refugees then who came um, directly to families. And as part of the support package for them, we put an enhanced level agreement in place with the GP practices and as part of the process we support families to register with GP practices 
and then to have the offer of screening and also the wider health supporting in place. We do work closely with the local authority and uh, we have the prevention and response group that meets fortnightly and um, the, the support as part of the joint support is, is covered as part of there from a governance perspective as well. Hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, OK, well, uh, thank you uh, um, and thank you, Carol, for, for that report uh, and we'll move on if there are no any no more uh, questions and so on. So uh, so we move on to the winter resilience report. Um, uh, we're asked to uh, endorse the actions of the health board in relation to this uh, uh, to, to, to the winter plan. Um, Carol's going to lead us through this uh, and as we've already acknowledged uh, um, and as everyone knows that just switches on a news bulletin or reads a newspaper uh, things are, are very very pressurized challenged and and tough at the moment and therefore it's absolutely uh, crucial that uh, that health boards along with partners um, plan in detail and effectively uh, to respond to those challenges and so uh, Carol's going to take us through what's been happening uh, within our health board. Uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, uh, I've been in the NHS for a very long time and I've uh, got to say that this has probably been the, well, without exception, the most difficult uh, winter period for the health and care system. And so important that we as a board consider the uh, plan that we put in place with partners the steps that we've taken to implement that plan and then additional uh, issues, uh, risks and, and actions that we have uh, been uh, grappling with. Um, uh, colleagues will will um, will be drawn in here. Uh, I've already referenced uh, Hayley as Director of Primary Care Community Mental Health, uh, but also Mez as Public Health Director and uh, Steve as uh, Planning and Performance uh, Director or, or may wish uh, to contribute. Um, so I'm just going to give a bit of an outline um, just by way of reminder. The winter plan came to the board in September 2022 Welsh Government didn't have a requirement uh, for us to submit our winter plan, uh, but nonetheless, we developed that um, during August and September with colleagues in the regional partnership board, so in the local authority and in the third sector. That plan came here in September and to the RPB in October, and it focused on five key areas. So the report seeks to give an overview, um, Not it's not a comprehensive, um, uh, detailed uh, report on each aspect, but tr tries to draw out the uh, the, the key issues. Um, and I think, you know, I've put in there in bold, this in summary, across the range of areas, there are significant issues and higher level risks being both realised and uh, and managed. Um, and we have the risk um, uh, register uh, later on. And, you know, just to uh, indicate that we have had a very uh, detailed and very constructive conversation about the level of risk um, uh, there, there is has, has been certainly in the system. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, uh, you, you know, we, we've started to emerge I and mean, I don't want to count any chickens before they hatch, but started to emerge into a slightly uh, better place. But for the three weeks or so over Christmas, it was extremely difficult. Now that that better place is through further actions and steps that have been uh, needed uh, in order to reduce harm and to try to improve the experience of uh, patients. But um, uh, Chair, if I may just offer an apology to people who uh, will have at times found it difficult to access uh, the service, be that from an ambulance point of view, be that in primary care, um, uh, be that in other parts of the system, they may well have had their planned uh, care operation uh, postponed. So 
this is this is something that is of, of deep regret to us and of um, uh, increasing concern. But I'd also like to just uh, mention a word of thanks to colleagues who have been working absolutely tirelessly to try to see as many patients uh, as they can. So uh, I wanted to recognise that staff across the system have gone above and beyond in very difficult circumstances. So with, with that, uh, Chair, I'm just going to um, uh, look to draw in a, a couple of colleagues who will be able to take us through. And um, and I wonder, Hayley, if I could come to you first on the six goals area and the primary care area uh, as well, if that's OK. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, Yes, I mean, in terms of the, the demand, obviously, not only the, the fifth wave of, of COVID, um, but obviously the um, prevalence of respiratory viruses, um, influenza, but also um, strep A and the scarlet fever position had, for example, um, around primary care um, in terms of urgent access, um, doubled the number of patients they needed to, to triage and see uh, at times during this uh, these last few weeks. And as a result of that, um, Welsh Government wrote out to primary care to indicate that they recognise that pressure, the need to focus on urgent care. So that has been the case and we're working alongside our primary care partners um, to make sure that that transition back to, to dealing with the routine work is done as quickly as possible, um, uh, recognising um, that, that that is part of the contractual requirements that, that we have for primary care and how we support them to do that. Also, we've thankfully had well established virtual wards in place in primary care and uh, have been utilising them fully during this period. And uh, you will hear a little bit later about some of the surge plans that we've put in place across the whole system. But in particular, we identified capacity, bed capacity in our community hospitals to enable our GPs to be able to admit, which was trying to stem uh, and avoid admissions uh, going through to our district general hospital. So it has been a, a challenging period. Uh, across the whole system, which hasn't been helped by some of the workforce pressures that we've experienced as well with short term sickness. And that has been uh, across the whole system, both in primary, social and across the health system as a whole, including the third sector. So uh, very, very difficult uh, period indeed. Um, I just wanted to pick up around 111 um, and the way in which the, 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 the patients access uh, services, urgent access to services, and that has been under unprecedented pressures as well. And uh, interestingly, um, we had to put in place contingency arrangements to cover um, the unprecedented demand of the high volume of calls that 111 were experiencing. And, uh, to be frank, a lot of those calls were for the uh, age range of under 15s, um, particularly a lot of uh, support needed uh, during that period as well to support families, uh, children and young people. The uh, acute hospitals, we've talked before about our relationship with our acute hospitals and how important it is for us to try and do everything we can to avoid admissions, but also for those patients who end up in an acute hospital setting to get them back into Powys um, uh, home, ideally first, uh, but to to back to within Powys as quickly as possible. And um, you know, our acute hospitals have been at the highest level of escalation throughout this uh, th this last period. Um, and just to give you a bit of a sense, um, the level that the acute hospitals have had to surge to in terms of and the impact on routine care has been substantial. So um, uh, in, in the report, you can see the, the level of beds that the that, that, that surge numbers across ways approximately 500. And that has been a challenge, um, uh, but also in support of trying to reduce handover delays to WAST and getting people into the hospitals as quickly as possible. Um, in support of that, as a health board, uh, we have um, uh, had a plan in place to surge our beds, so to open additional beds across our sites. I've mentioned to you the three GP assessment beds, but a total of 11. 
uh, beds uh, which we have utilised during this period due to the uh, demands of people returning into Powys. Um, and we're continuously trying to improve our discharge profile, um, uh, both within our community hospitals, uh, but also in terms of the work that we've done to, to try and streamline assessment. And that's part of the, the work uh, that's set out in the rapid escalation plan. Um, just to give you a bit of a sense, yesterday we had 55 uh, patients in our community hospitals who were medically fit for discharge, uh, 31 ready to leave and the others going through the assessment uh, processes. So it is a substantial issue at the moment around the availability of community capacity to be able to support uh, getting people to the right locations. Um, the report also covers the particular challenges that our social care colleagues are facing around particularly social work workforce issues to be able to assess and, and uh, also domiciliary care provision particularly. And again, in terms of scale of that, yesterday um, we had we have um, 89 people await those who, who of those who've been assessed, 89 people were awaiting packages of care to give you a bit of sense of the scale uh, and also an additional 24 uh, patients awaiting packages of care um, who are currently in interim uh, placements. So part of that has been the work with uh, PAVO uh, supporting around the really successful welfare call system that's been put in place uh, during the pandemic and, and, and establishing that again. And also for us as a health board, making sure that we are exploring every opportunity that we can to support that broader community capacity. So two key areas I just wanted to highlight is we are in active discussions as we speak with the Care Inspectorate Wales around the ability to expand uh, the provision uh, in Knighton Hospital, which is we've got a residential care uh, facility, cottage view in Knighton Hospital, and basically to establish additional capacity there so they were able to offer step down interim placements to support the pressures currently. So really working hard on that. And also secondly, we're scoping up whether the potential to provide uh, domiciliary care services um, in addition to um, community healthcare that we, we currently do um, is possible as well and working closely with CIW and colleagues in uh, the local authority on targeting those areas uh, because we recognise that the domiciliary care market in particular, the ability of the market to respond across the rural parts of Powys is problematic. And so we're, we're looking at whether we need to, well, whether we need to, how we can uh, step into that space to support uh, further flow. So that just gives you a little bit of a, an overview, um, but I'm happy to take any further questions. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thanks, Hayley. If I could just draw Steve in and, and Mez as to whether you wanted to add anything uh, to uh, to that presented by Hayley. Yeah, thank you, Carl. And yes, Chair, and um, we going back to some, Ronnie's uh, question about relationships, relationships are absolutely key um, during these the, these difficult times are uh, operational um, working relationships with all of our providers across England and Wales enable us to try and have a proactive approach to uh, both the number of patients that are entering into those district general hospitals but we can make um, robust plans for those discharge of patients back to um, either home as Hayley said or our community providers I think it is. It will be a challenging period, though, as, as Carol and, other, and others have um, have mentioned. And we need to draw on some of the uh, um, either best practice or developments as part of our IMTP going forward into the next year and beyond. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And then just just Mayors in in terms of some of the wider public health and the the real challenge that we've uh, we've been facing with respiratory viruses, so Mayors. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so as um, Hayley mentioned, we've experienced our fifth wave of uh, COVID um, during the last sort of year, but also coincided with high rates of flu circulating at the same time, as well as um, RSV 
and scarlet fever and strep A in, de in December. So a significant impact um, in terms of population, staffing, elements, and pressures there. It does appear from uh, the latest data from ONS last Friday um, that the COVID wave may have peaked. However, rates are still, you know, one in 22 estimated to be infected in, in Wales with COVID sort of currently. Um, in terms of sort of vaccinations, we've been rolling out the autumn um, booster campaign. So our uptake there is over 80% um, currently in terms of the latest sort of data. So um, good response there from the community, but our mass vax um, doors are still open to anybody who may have missed their appointment um, or if they were infected when they were due for their vaccination, they can come forward and we would encourage that. And the teams are continually contacting um, residents who are eligible, who haven't as yet um, received their booster. Um, and in terms of flu, I um, similar in Paris and across Wales, uh, flu vaccination uptake rates are a lot lower than where we would um, desire them to, to be. Um, so flu is vaccine is offered through a number of sources, a GP for eligible adults, as well as some community pharmacy. And um, to coincide with the peak in flu, we did also expand the offer of flu vaccines through our MVCs um, for anybody who hasn't had an opportunity, who is eligible for flu vaccine. Um, they can also walk into any of the mass vac centres as well as um, contact your GP, who many of them still have flu vaccine as well. The message there really is it's not too late to have your flu vaccine, it's not too late to have um, COVID vaccine, if you are in eligible groups, that's currently our best um, protection. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank, thank you, Mayors. Just in summary then, uh, Chair and, and colleagues, um, uh, just a, a final sort of uh, note on this is that we have uh, well, we haven't uh, fully implemented and deployed the local options framework. Uh, colleagues who have been uh, around the board for some time will know that that is a Welsh government uh, piece of guidance that uh, means that we can on a temporary basis make some service uh, changes um, and redeployments. We haven't deployed that at this stage, uh, but we have uh, refocused uh, people's work onto the system pressures uh, for, for leaders and managers in, in particular. And then uh, finally, uh, we are clearly uh, going through a period of industrial uh, dispute um, and to note that this is um, increasing in frequency and in scale uh, and there is uh, more work for us to do in um, trying to risk mitigate um, the, the, the consequences of having um, significantly fewer staff available uh, across the, the, the wider healthcare system. So uh, the board is asked to consider the progress that has been made and the actions that we have taken, uh, some of which have gone um, rather above and beyond. Uh, when we wrote the plan, we didn't uh, have the industrial action um, uh, uh, in, in our, in our uh, front view uh, mirror. Um, and to endorse the approach that we have taken and the partial activation of diverting some of our management um, uh, capacity to uh, to winter system pressures. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Carol and uh, exec colleagues. Uh, um, we've got about 10 minutes now or uh, just over for questions and conversation and discussion. Uh, we have some people that have indicated that they want to come in. It just gives an idea as to uh, what, what, uh, how long we've got. So um, let me bring in uh, Robert uh, first, please. Thank you, Chair. First of all, to commend the very detailed and urgent work that's been done in these uh, unprecedented um, demands. My question is about uh, 111, which, uh, as you know better than I do, is a very, is a crucial part of the response. Um, during Christmas, I am aware of people who you know, um, couldn't get through um, in 111, uh, couldn't get a response from the GP practice, were really left, um, you know, um, not knowing what to do. So it is very important 111. And I just uh, wondered whether the extra capacity that was being built in, whether that would now be a permanent feature 
because um, you know the importance in one 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 in directing people. Uh, you know, when they have young children who have very high temperatures, etc., can't be uh, underestimated. Thank you. Okay. Actually, if we could perhaps take a couple of questions and then uh, uh, come back. So, any other general one? Do you have Jen? Diolch, doing uh, just waiting for the signal, but uh, not quite You're sure good if people can. OK, I will I will go then. Do you talk about I, I too, like Robert, want, would like to endorse um, the very candid, appreciated the candid nature of this paper and the very thorough nature of it and, and applaud the progress that has been made given the challenges um, and, uh, you know, acknowledge the huge effort made by so many and would also like to add my thanks to everybody out there right now doing some excellent work. Um, my question is uh, is in the section impl implementation progress section point four, rapid response in physical and mental crisis. I note of course, the comments made about ambulance service delays at emergency departments and that uh, key incidents are being jointly investigated with WAST. Really pleased to see that those incidents are being investigated. My question is, um, well, first of all, I note that we are part of that investigation. I think that's great. My question is, what's the feedback mechanism of the outcomes of that investigation. How does the how will the learning feed into ours and others improvement plans? I'd look, I'd, I'd appreciate the answer to that. And secondly, um, NHS 101 Press 2 campaign um, for our mental, uh, the mental health um, uh, helpline. Are you happy that this is being widely publicised enough and that it can meet the demand that it is likely to drive? Jochen Bauer. Yeah, Jen. Uh, so perhaps we could take uh, the, those questions. Uh, I don't know if it's the same person, Carol, that will take them, but we have the the one 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 um, and, and uh, uh, Jen's questions about um, ambulance learning and the one 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 plus two. So uh, yeah, th thank, thanks, Chair. I think probably Haley will be able to pick up the one 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 and the press two. And if I could ask Claire to just outline the uh, learning from feedback, because there's a, something called the putting things right uh, process that uh, that we can share. And and of course, uh, Claire's uh, background, um, she joined us from the Welsh Ambulance Services Trust, so we'll be able to comment uh, well on that. So if that's OK, if, if Haley uh, go, goes first and then I'll supplement anything uh, beyond that. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, just in terms of 111, um, the point around the capacity, it was unprecedented the number of calls that came through um, uh, during this last uh, well, Christmas time, particularly, um, which meant that the abandoned abandonment rate was extremely high. Um, normally we find it sort of runs around, around about three, between three and five percent with normal activity levels. Your particular point around will the additional phone line capacity still be available? That has been increased. However, there has been some learning around the contingency arrangements we put in at pace in terms of handling peaks, extreme and expected peaks in demand. Um, and I think that there will be a, a review undertaken uh, together nationally on the 111 process going forward, and we will play our part in that. But just to give you a bit of a sense, there is a daily meeting um, that, that we participate in, and we will continue to do that around out of hours, the 111 system and the issues that we're, we're, we're currently handling. But I'm happy to bring back uh, further update to uh, the relevant committee around the progress that we made from a lessons learned perspective during uh, the particular peaks that we've handled around 111. Um, uh, I think the other issue was around 111 Press 2, and I think it's absolutely right. Uh, just to let you know that we have advertised for capacity and posts to take forward the implementation of, of 111 Press 2 in Powys. Um, that is planned over the next uh, quarter, so work is ongoing with that. So we will publicise it uh, further when we are able to go live on the system. So that's why we haven't pressed uh, sort of uh, the publicity button yet uh, in terms of that. We're still in building that facility for, for Powys. 
And your point around is there sufficient capacity to meet with the potential demand around 111 Press 2? That will be part of the ongoing arrangements and monitoring uh, as we go live and as that progresses over the next uh, few months. So again, very happy to provide members with an update on both the implementation of 111 Press 2 and the impact and activity levels that that will experience as we go live. I hope that's OK, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, Hayley and Claire. Sorry, Chair. No, please, Claire. Hello, good morning all. Just checking I've got the signal and you can hear me. Yes, um, so, can. Yeah, thank you for that question, um, Jen. And actually, I could probably take most of the rest of the meeting describing all of the infrastructure that is in place surrounding both the reporting of incidents, the monitoring of um, investigations and the learning from that. But very broadly, obviously, we have the putting things right process in Wales, which very clearly outlines how we respond to anybody that raises um, a concern or a complaint. And and certainly if that person had a concern that spanned their journey or across um, various different organisations, then we would apply a joint approach to be able to review that. In terms of our incident reporting and our incident reviews, there is actually a very um, good piece of work happening within Wales at the moment, um, really building on the joint investigation framework. So what previously used to happen was it was something called the Appendix B. So where WAST had identified an incident that they attributed to a delay in them being able to respond as a direct result of a handover delay at a health board, then they would pass that um, particular incident to be led by that health board concerned. What we've recognised in that, in that is that that was probably a little bit almost too simple and too one dimensional, because if we think from a powers perspective, we would have a powers resident that could potentially be taken to a ED department outside of powers where there is a delay with another health board. And obviously that involves WAST. So you can talk about there that you've got three organisations that obviously have a real role to play in investigating that incident. So there is a piece of work being led currently um, by the delivery unit and the Welsh Ambulance Service and involves all health boards in Wales, looking at the joint investigation framework and particularly looking at how we we improve those processes and we are core to that. In fact, it's actually meeting as we speak today um, in terms of looking at how that develops. Within the Welsh Ambulance Service, they have a process where they review all incidents where harm has occurred um, in something known as their Serious Case Incident Forum. And if that has involved a powers resident, we will be invited directly to that meeting, or if not, we will be communicated with after that. Um, and there is a very close relationship between our patient safety team here within Powys and all of the patient safety teams actually across the other organisations but particularly we do have that relationship with WAST where we will liaise with one another um, and coordinate that joint um, investigation. So I hope that answers the question. It is a very complex and um, quite you know, broad subject matter that I'm happy to discuss outside of the meeting, but hopefully that gives a little bit of assurance. Thank you. Thank you, Claire and others. Uh, I haven't got time really to go back to Robert and Jen to ask them to come back in because we need to go to Ian for his uh, his question. But uh, please do put in the in the chat pane or um, or take up Claire on her invitation to uh, have a conversation outside of the meeting if there is anything further uh, that you would like uh, assurance around in relation to the questions that you've asked. Um, but we'll go finally to Ian uh, and uh, uh, please, Ian. Yeah, well, um, the same two areas for me, actually, um, that have previously been uh, covered, but just just an additional question on 111. First of all, the mental health 111 press 2 um, probably goes without saying, but it's important to note. My assumption is that we'll come back to this after uh, a period to see its effectiveness. That is part of the plan. Um, I think good to note that. The other one was it was um, in in relation to the 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 the, uh, the 
current 111 system and it's good to note that the con contingency arrangements hadn't haven't to date had to be um uh, activated and you mentioned Haley the the increased capacity and the learning from that I think th the question that I'm kind of left with um with, with with that is is it our expectation that the actions um that are put in place will will lead to a, a an improvement and that improvement will be sustained so a bit of an impossible question really but imposed the important to uh, to know what our expectation is on 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 those new arrangements Thank you. Uh, Hayley, do you, are you going to take this or? Yeah, happy to. Um, we we, we need to be we, we need to be quite brief, Hayley, if, uh, if if you would, please. Yes, so, yeah. yeah, yes, of course. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, yes, Ian, um, in terms of the impact of, of 111, um, uh, I think we'll, I'd need to come back to you with the evaluation of that, um, because I think that generally we had an unprecedented number of calls come through during that period. Um, and so um, I can't really answer Ian's question, Chair, um, in terms of uh, just to say that the evaluation of both uh, 111 Press 2 and the general uh, approach to 111 will be evaluated and we'll bring it back. OK, uh, I, I assume Hayley, that, that would go to um, a committee initially, is that right? Is that yeah. uh, so to where? I would suggest probably the performance uh, committee would be the, the right place. Yeah. 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 OK, OK. And uh, when will that be? Uh, do you have you any idea of time scale? Can I check on that chair and get back to you? That's OK, OK, Thanks. OK. okay. Uh, thank you. OK, well, well, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, just to add my word of appreciation to those of other independent members and indeed exec colleagues, uh, um, you know, it has been, as we've all acknowledged, an unprecedented difficult period and indeed continues to be and uh, um, I'm beginning to uh, get out and about uh, and, and meet people across the, the, the various health board sites and uh, certainly even the small glimpse that I'm getting is of an organisation and of personnel that are straining every sinew uh, to, um, uh, to respond to these challenges uh, people who I believe uh, certainly deserve our respect, appreciation and gratitude. So uh, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, so let's move on uh, to our planning arrangements. Um, and as we're all aware, uh, health boards are required to put in place uh, uh, an integrated medium term plan, an IMTP, uh, which is a, a rolling three year plan. Uh, work is being done. Uh, on our plan from next year onwards. And we don't have a paper for this item, uh, but Steve um, is going to, I think, uh, uh, share information with us uh, through a presentation. So over to you, Steve, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And um, part of the presentation will be delivered by Pete Hopgood, our, our Director of Finance um, also. Um, so if we could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we just wanted to um, introduce the uh, IMTP uh, as a uh, as a presentation and also to confirm why we're bringing this presentation to the board at this time. So we would like the, the board to um, confirm our purpose and the requirements of the IMTP, the, the outline that we've taken so far, which I'll come on to in a little bit more detail. Pete will deliver the financial update reconfirm our commitment to some of the guiding principles within our longer term strategy documents and note the timescales for uh, the development of the plan and submission. So next slide, please. So the purpose of, of and requirements of the IMTP is described in, in this slide. There's a diagram on the right hand side which depicts how the IMTP um, is a key vehicle uh, for Welsh Government, but also um, health boards in terms of how they, they link to operational delivery, planning framework, ministerial priorities and uh, government at large. And then on the left hand side is some of the detail around the purpose of the IMTP in terms of each health board must set out a strategy for improving health for, for the people who it is responsible for. 
the requirements of the IMTP, which sets out the statutory duty to break even, ministerial priorities in terms of what's, what really matters to, to the health minister and, and how we uh, should deliver those, those specific aims, how an IMTP gets approved, both approval at board level and submission to Welsh Government, and really the IMTP is the main vehicle for accountability, delivery and oversight during the um, during the year, uh, particularly um, joint executive team meetings, quarterly integrated quality performance review meetings, annual report and so on. So that's how the, the mechanism of the IMTP works and its purpose. Next slide, please. So the approach that we've taken so far has, has been to um, have a number of um, pieces of work and undertaken behind the scenes, which we've brought to a number of board development sessions um, and working with partners so that we really um, understand both our current position, some of the factors that have influenced our um, delivery of healthcare, confirm our principles for our strategic framework and our strategic partners and what we really need to to do is assemble all that information against the planning framework that's, that has been released um, by um, Welsh Government in November to form a comprehensive and cohesive plan that we can all stand by uh, as a board and, and on behalf of the, the, the residents that we serve so that, that's what we're seeking to do so next slide please so we've said as a health board that we do want to um, maintain our long term ambition and, and keep our plans aligned across uh, not only some of the national, national strategies, but those regionally and locally, be that at um, um, RPB and PSB, but also um, with um, local authority, uh, GPs in terms of cluster plans. So this is a slide that, de that depicts um, how our IMTP needs to factor in all of those um, key relationships and also that our plan aligns at, at any one point and can be cut in a variety of ways uh, to show the, the, the cohesive nature of it. Next slide please. As part of that we've reaffirmed our guiding principles that the Health Board has put together um, and, and, and has held um, for, for a number of years, so that's do what matters, do what works, focus on greatest need, offer fair access, be prudent and work with communities and, and people. I mean, I mean, obviously those are the, um, those priorities are really getting tested at, at the moment, given the um, pressures on the NHS and, and some of the financial outlook that will be discussed shortly, but those are our guiding principles and we've reaffirmed those, which is, which is an important thing to do. Next slide, please. So this slide um, summarises the variety of planning guidance that has come out from um, NHS Wales and there's three broad pillars that we've um, used to describe the, the um, guidance. The first column on the left hand side is the, gen or the general requirements from um, the uh, Director General and Chief Executive of the, of the NHS in, in Wales and so um, there are items in there which we were asked to focus on in terms of ongoing response to the pandemic, universal and core healthcare provision, recovery and sustainability. Uh, we're asked to look for golden threads throughout our plan in terms of quality of care, prevention, reducing health inequalities and so on. And also with one eye on, on the effective use of resources, you know, uh, an improvement, a requirement to improve efficiency and effectiveness and optimization of services. In response to some of the issues across the NHS, uh, both from an access perspective, the Minister has identified some key priorities um, specifically for next year um, around delayed transfers care, primary community access, urgent and emergency care, planned care recovery, diagnostics and general improvement to pathways of care and modernisation, cancer recovery, mental health and, and children's services. Those are are um, key deliverables for the uh, new financial year and beyond and a lot of the um, key aims are required to be supported by the, the infrastructure um, of, of health boards so digital workforce finance and so on 
And then the final column on the right hand side are again some broad principles that um, the NHS is, is asking us to um, achieve or, or pay recognition to. So again, prevention, clinical improvements, new legislation in terms of duty candor and duty of quality, COVID-19 response and so on. Next slide, please. So what we've tried to do in this slide is then marry up the strategic priorities of the health board with the actual um, uh, requirements of the, of the planning guidance. So this slide summarises at a high level what we aim to achieve across the broad headings and then the 14 subcategories of um, delivery underpinned by um, workforce, digital environments and so on. Next slide, please. So I'll hand over um, to my colleague Pete, who's going to um, give an update yeah. on the Thank yeah, you. thanks very much, Steve. So um, just really going to take us through the financial plan context. Uh, this will be based on the allocation letter that the health board received just before Christmas. I'll pull out some of the key points from the presentation and also link that to our current financial position. And these are going to be the parameters in which we develop our financial plan alongside meeting those priorities as Steve has just outlined. So some of the key messages is that this is a budget in hard times. We know that the, the macroeconomic outlook based on the, the UK government autumn statement is um, is challenging. It's clear that 2022-23 was a transitional year. We're no longer going to be in transition and this links into some of the funding that we've been allocated in the current year to help us as we've um, transitioned out of the pandemic. It's clear that the investment and cost growth in 22-23 has not demonstrated the benefits that were expected and this needs to be a focus for us in the years going forward. And as a health board and, and across the health system, we haven't delivered the required level of recurrent savings. We've met a level of savings, but it's been done on a non-recurrent basis and this can't continue going into the, to the next financial year. Clearly, as we'll all be aware in our, in our home lives and across the whole economy that there are significant inflationary pressures at the moment. Um, it's not absolutely clear what the level of that challenge will be, but it's clear that we'll have to take all actions possible to mitigate the impact of that inflationary pressure. And we're going to need to deliver on the challenge of uh, both financial sustainability in the short term, but basically with that aim of longer term sustainability and how we ensure that we put our financial resource in the best place for the best outcome for the population of Powys. And move on, please, Liz. So, so just some key numbers just to, to back up the uh, the context that we're talking about. So there's £165 million of additional funding for health in 23-24. That is equivalent to a 1.5% core uplift of that £165 million across NHS Wales. £90 million is, is being allocated to health boards. So for Powys, our share of that, our 1.5% one, our 1 core uplift is just three, over £3.8 million. 25 million has been ring fenced for mental health, 15 million for direct funded bodies such as Public Health Wales, Digital Healthcare Wales, and HIW. And there's 10 million, 10 million being allocated for social care. And we're not quite clear on how that funding will be used at, at the current time. And another key issue is that the cost of a 23 24 pay award will be met by Welsh Government in addition to the core uplift, as I've just outlined. Other key area to flag is that. Um, uh, included in the current year, current year, we received our share of the national 170 million to support sustainability and recovery. Um, going into next year, there will be a change in that distribution with 120 million being allocated directly to health boards and 50 million being held back to support regional solutions. We're still working through what, exactly what that means, but in terms of the, uh, the direct allocation, that will reduce our allocation from 7.5 million to 5.3 million, so a reduction of 2.2 million. Other key areas in relation to, to the pandemic, um, we've received our allocations identified in relation to testing, tracing and protect, and in relation to mass vaccination. And at the moment, those allocations are significantly lower than the current cost of services as they've been provided in, in this financial year, 22-23, with a roughly a 60% reduction against TTP and a reduction in relation to mass facts from 3.5 million to 1.7 million. 
So this is a key area of, um, for us to work through in terms of how it fits into our overall plan and our IMTP. And generally the expectation is that organisations and those national programmes make significant reductions in their run rate in relation to the ongoing COVID response. Next slide, please. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Pete, I'm just conscious of time. We've got about five minutes left for this agenda items, and I'm, I want to uh, obviously give time for questions and discussion as well. So uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, sure. I'll, do, I'll probably do it in another 30 seconds, Carl. So uh, you know, the key expectation is that as a health board and all health boards to require two and a half percent recurrent savings as part of their plan, energy costs and management actions to be taken to mitigate those costs and benefits are key. Uh, the capital outlook is very similar to what has been in this financial year. Again, it's been going to be very challenging. So I'll, I'll pause there and uh, hand back over to Steve. Thank you, Pete. Um, final slide, please, um, Liz. Thank you. So just briefly, Chair and, and board members, the um, this slide just summarises the key timescales um, across the uh, top row in terms of what needs uh, needs to be done. The orange indicates um, actual submissions to um, either, either internally or externally and the um, purple horizontal bars show the, the, the key components of work that need to get done in the remaining weeks to enable the submission of an IMTP. If we're not able to submit an IMTP, a balanced IMTP, we need to indicate that uh, through the submission of an accountable letter on the 28th of February, Either way, the submission is the 31st of March. Um, thank you. Thank you, Steve and Pete, uh, much appreciated. Uh, um, uh, of course, we did have an opportunity a few days ago as a board to look at this in, in a bit more detail in a board development session. So uh, um, uh, that, that was very, very helpful. Uh, but uh, um, are there any, uh, any members that want to come in at this juncture with an observation or question. Uh, Simon, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, uh, my question is in relation to the 15 million for direct funded bodies. Um, and just uh, what, what assurances do we have of impact or can we ask for with respect to impact and value for money? Because that's a sizable allocation in a very cost pressured environment as against 10 million for social care. So I just wonder what kind of assurances we can request around around that or that we already have. Ronnie, would you like to come in as well, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, this is just a direct question to Pete, please. Um, in relation to the 90 million um, health board allocation and our share of 3.8 million or which is rather less than 5%. Is that a constant percentage that we get in relation to that allocation or does that tend to vary dependent upon the allocations to other health boards do? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, will the same person take both of those questions? Uh, is it Steve or Pete? It's probably it's probably best myself chair. So if okay, I if I, yeah. if I answer uh, um, Ronnie's question first, so so Ronnie, yes, that that percentage, the, the 4.2 percent, is our population share of of allocations, and that's the method by which those allocations are allocated. So it's quite a straightforward formula, and that is what's used. Um, there is some ongoing work in the background looking at how allocations are made, and and any changes in that would apply to additional funding going forward. But that is a constant percentage at the moment. In terms of Simon's question, so we have our um, um, we have our relationship with the with the with the directly funded bodies, and we have uh, performance metrics that we look at in terms of the services they provide, which relate to ourselves. And in a, there is that management monitoring process that takes place to um, uh, to assure ourselves that we're provide, right, they're providing the services for ourselves directly and then overall how that works nationally. So there is a process in place for that. Thank you. Simon, Ronnie, would you like to come back on on those responses or are you satisfied? I'm satisfied, Chair, thank you. I'm also fine with that. Thank you, Pete. Thank you very much. Uh, so just to round off this item, I'm going to invite Carol to come in uh, with some uh, uh, final observations. Please, Carol. 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. And uh, th thanks to colleagues for preparing the uh, the item. Um, I, I just wanted to be really clear uh, with with the board uh, how serious a position this is. Um, uh, Steve mentioned on that last slide uh, something about an AO letter, accountable officer letter. Um, uh, as uh, I've been the accountable officer in the organisation for, for eight years, uh, I very rarely had to resort to uh, writing to government uh, any uh, accountable officer letters. In, in fact, I think I might have done two uh, in my in my whole eight years. Um, it is likely uh, just to advise you that I will be writing an accountable officer letter uh, at the end of February to indicate that at that stage, with uh, work still ongoing, of course, um, that there are some very significant uh, impacts and issues to such a uh, challenging cost reduction um, uh, scenario and that um, based on the work we've done to date, uh, try getting to a break even position in one year uh, is unlikely uh, to be uh, achievable. Um, now, that's a very hard sort of message to to deliver, given the uh, direction from from the government. And we will, of course, keep working really hard on this. Um, but right the way across the NHS, whether that's in Wales or in other uh, uh, nations of the UK, we're all facing uh, the same uh, significant challenges. Um, so, uh, Chair, I just wanted to to, to make um, board members aware we've been through the IMTP many years now and we've always um, sought to submit and we've been successful in submitting approvable plans and we've delivered uh, those plans. Um, I think this is extremely difficult to be able to give assurance that we can do the same this year. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, um, uh, and uh, I say well, thank you. <laughs> it's a very, very difficult uh, um, message and uh, a difficult situation to, to, to manage, isn't it? But uh, um, so in relation to this item, uh, we are asked as a board to receive assurance that the development of the plan is proceeding uh, as, need, as, as, it, as it needs to proceed and, uh, and that we are meeting the defined deadlines. Um, so uh, um, I can't see everyone on the screen, uh, so I'm uh, if anyone is not happy uh, uh, to um, receive that assurance or, or thinks that it's inappropriate to receive that, that assurance, please indicate in the chat pane. Otherwise, um, I will assume that you're uh, you're content with the assurance we've received. OK, thank you. Um, th th there is no dissent. Uh, and uh, with apologies from me, I want to just take us very quickly back to the previous item uh, to the Winter Resilience Report, because what I omitted to do was actually to put the decision uh, to the uh, to the board, uh, because we are asked to endorse the actions uh, of the um, Winter Resilience Report um, and the approaches being taken to manage uh, the various system risks. Uh, and so again, um, I'm asking board members to indicate in the chat pane if you're not happy to endorse those actions uh, and support the approaches taken. Okay, so therefore we, we do endorse that and we do support those uh, those approaches. Thank you very much. Uh, so we go now to I item 2.3 of the agenda and to the Charitable Fund's uh, annual report and annual accounts. It's good to have with us uh, Gareth Lacey and Kai Hale um, from Audit Wales, the auditors of the accounts. Uh, I should explain that um, uh, these accounts uh, have been uh, scrutinised by the uh, Charitable Funds Committee, um, have been endorsed and, uh, and accepted uh, by that committee, and the recommendation of the committee is that the board uh, um, approves uh, the the uh, report and the accounts uh, brought to us today. Uh, but I'm going to go uh, initially to Pete, and then uh, probably to Gareth and or Kai um, for the uh, for the auditor's opinion. But uh, Pete, any comment? 
Uh, no, thank you, Chair. And actually, you you covered the introduction that I was going to give. So you you've covered those points. The uh, uh, the relevant paper, the and accounts are included in in the board documents. You've got three appendices: the accounts, the ISA two hundred and sixty, which um, Gareth Kai will comment on, and the letter of representation. So it's probably best to go to go to Gareth for any any comments from Audit Wales, um, and then to come back um, in terms of formal approval. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gareth and or, or Kai, who's going to come in? Yes, yeah, so thank you, Chair, uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, as uh, as you said, uh, my name is Gareth Lucy. I'm the audit manager with responsibility for uh, the audit of the, the charity this year. Uh, and with me is Kai Hale, our audit lead, uh, who's responsible for for leading uh, the audit uh, in day to day. Um, so yeah, just here really to present the findings of our uh, audit of accounts report. Hopefully, everyone's had a chance to read over them. And, and as the chair mentioned, this has already gone to charitable funds committee for consideration there. Um, we've just got a, a few main headlines really to, to run through the report. I was going to hand over to, to Kai to run through those, if that's okay. Please do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Gareth, and uh, good morning, everyone. So, yeah, just to go over those main points that Gareth um, mentioned there. Overall, we intend to issue an unqualified audit opinion, i.e. A, a clean audit opinion, and um, that proposed audit report is set out in Appendix 2 of the um, ISA 260 report. As with any audit, misstatements have been identified and subsequently uh, corrected. So a summary of those corrections made is set out in Appendix 3 of the report. Um, these misstatements were very minor in nature and don't cause us any concern of any pervasive issues. On page 4 of the main report, um, you can see that there are no uncorrected misstatements remaining within the accounts and over on uh, the next page as well. No other significant issues. We haven't identified any significant issues arising from the audit. So yeah, just from our perspective, the audit was a really smooth process. And you know, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Sarah, the team, and everyone involved uh, for all their hard work and help in getting this audit over the line. So yeah, thank you. That's great. Thank yeah, you. Th th thank you, Guy. And, and I suppose just to, to round things off, Chair. Yeah, nothing else to report. I'd like to echo my thanks as well to to Sarah, Pete, and the team. Uh, and subject to the board's approval today, the plan would be for the Auditor General then to certify the accounts on the 30th of January, which will be the 31st of January statutory deadline. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone want to come in in relation to this agenda item? Anyone want to comment? Doesn't seem so. Uh, and so we're asked to approve the Charitable Fund's annual, recount, annual report and accounts uh, uh, for period 31st of March 22. Uh, and this is also a recommendation that's come from the Charitable Funds Committee. Um, uh, so uh, please indicate again in the chat uh, pane if any members are unhappy uh, to approve the report and accounts. Oh, no, I think so, Pete would like to just come back in if he may. Yeah, he, he wants to come in after we've made the decision, I think. Uh, yes, please. So, yeah, so that's fine. So no, no nobody's indicating. So, um, uh, uh, so the board unanimously uh, approves those and uh, please come in, Pete. Thank you, Chair. It was just to note my thanks to, to Gareth and Kai and, and the audit team for, for the way the audit was um, conducted. I think it's a really strong relationship between our teams. So just really to to echo their their thanks to us back to them and also to know my thanks to to our, our team, to Sarah and, um, and others that have been involved in the process. So so thank you very much. Yes, and, and, and again, from a board perspective, uh, uh, echo all of that. I, I won't repeat it, but echo it. It uh, uh, certainly seems to me that uh, uh, you know, I've, I've uh, had various touch points with the charity over many, many years in former roles. And uh, it certainly seems to me that things are, uh, uh, are in a very, very uh, relatively strong position now and uh, uh, due to the uh, to the good work of the people that have been named and others. So uh, much appreciated. Uh, and uh, Gareth, Kai, thank you very much. Uh, uh, see you very soon. Thank you very much, Chair. Bye thank now. You. Uh, thank you. OK, so we're due for a break now. Uh, and uh, so we'll we will break uh, um, and we will resume promptly at 1140. 
so if people could make sure that uh, uh, they come back, perhaps with a cup of tea in hand, uh, but nonetheless, we, uh, we will resume at 11.40. <clears throat> See you in a few minutes. Thank you.
Well, Chris and all, e Bobby and Honaki, could be the book for being with the Cal Cavalier, um, a Gulavach, a Cam Banet, Huirach, and um, Barbukidi Dodnall. Now, the Isle Gachwin, Akvedroni and Seath at item uh, three point in our agenda. Uh, good to see everyone uh, back in the meeting, and uh, we turn now to item three point one uh, on the agenda. Um, having discussed uh, next year's IMTP, we now turn our attention to performance uh, against this year's plans and this year's requirements. Uh, Steve, I think you're going to uh, take us through this. Uh, probably worth saying for um, newer members of the board, such as such as me, uh, that uh, the last time we looked at one of these, which is the last meeting, it had already been to our uh, delivery and performance committee for scrutiny. Uh, this one hasn't, uh, nor because of uh, timetabling and so on, nor has it been to the exec committee. So it's coming directly to the board uh, for consideration and for discussion. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Chair. Um, colleagues, we are um, on page 116 of the wider board pack. And so for this agenda item, there's a six page covering paper, then a detailed uh, 99 page um, supporting documentation. So just dealing with the, the covering paper, the performance is reported to the end of November, month eight. And I'm asking the board to discuss and note the contents of the report. The executive summary um, goes on to describe some of the challenges that we've heard um, that are active in the NHS at the moment and how they've impacted upon some of the national metrics that, that we are measured against. Some of the um, highlights we've brought through in, into the covering paper, and I'll just go through um, some of them. So the first around vaccinations and screening, and our childhood vaccination programme is slightly below target, but generally performing well. Our COVID vaccine um, autumn campaign is, is going ext extremely well. Our flu uptake is below the um, required target, but uh, um, quite favourable when we compare our performance against the All Wales um, comparatives. And our cancer screening where we provide those services in parish ranks remains at rank one uh, for both bowel and breast screening. Now, Chair, I might just pause there and, and see whether Mez wants to come in on any of those um, indicators I've just described. Thank you, Mez. Yeah, thank you, Diolch. Yeah, so I covered uh, flu uptake earlier on, so I won't repeat that unless uh, members wish me to. Far from, you know, saying it's not where we wish it to be at this stage. Um, and in terms of childhood vaccinations um, element, really, the that element is, is performing well, but just wanted to draw members' attention to that we are doing a polio catch-up currently through primary care, and as part of that, that's aimed at um, age five and below, who may have missed uh, the vaccine um, over the last two years in terms of the impact of lockdown and um, clinics uh, not running properly as regularly as um, they were during that phase. Um, as part of that work, um, there would be also cleansing of the data and offer also of a catch up of MMR, either through GP practices or we're inviting um, to the MVCs as, as well during uh, February. So happy to take any questions. Okay, so um, do, you, do you want to pause there, Steve and Meredith, for questions, or do you want to take us through the covering part paper in total and come back? Yeah, yeah, that, that, I'll, I'll do that, uh, Chair. I'll, I'll carry on through the paper and okay. then come back for wider questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right. So the next section in the covering paper is around primary care and and Paris is a provider on again has performed well in terms of GP practices um, achieving all, all of the national standards um, set out for for access. Um, from an unscheduled care perspective, this is um, an update around the services that we provide, but also those that we commission. So our minor injury units in, in Paris that we provide continue to maintain a very good 
high compliance with the four hour standard and on virtually all patients that go through that those facilities are treated and discharged with, within the, the four hour standard. There have been some challenges around sickness um, in terms of maintaining all our unscheduled care services, but nevertheless, we still managed to maintain the performances described. Where patients are conveyed by, by Welsh Ambulance Service to district general hospitals outside of Paris, the response time in terms of the eight minute um, call, uh, call response time has not been delivering the uh, required target. Now that's consistent right across the uh, NHS as, as Carol and others have, have described earlier. So, but the, uh, the, the performance as described in this paper was 38% um, eight hour, eight minute compliance versus the target of 65 and the, and the position as of last week, the slight improvement to 43%, but still a long way off from where the uh, where the desired target for access should be for, for that emergency response. Um, because of the issues and with the um, district general hospitals, we have seen an increase in ambulance handover delays that further then um, exacerbates the problems with those emergency response times back in the community. Also, and the pressures on unscheduled care in district general hospitals is mean, meaning on occasions the planned care interventions, surgical interventions and so on and so forth are having to be cancelled to accommodate the, the, the medical patients that are coming through the door. So some of the there is a, some deterioration in uh, both RTT performance and an elongation in the, in the timescales for patients waiting. From a planned care perspective, for the services performed in Paris, the Paris provider arm continues to maintain that really strong performance. Now, obviously, um, that, that is excellent for, our, uh, excellent for our local residents. And we've just set out on page four of the paper that we haven't got any long waiting patients in our Paris provider arm, which is a credit to the team um, and, and the clinicians delivering those services. We're still working through some follow up validation as a health board. And from a diagnostic perspective, there have been some breaches both within diagnostic endoscopy and, and the wider suite of um, diagnostics. Some of those staffing related and some of those um, breaches driven by demand. And there have been some therapy breaches within, within the parish provider arm. Um, because the long term sickness and some staff turnover and vacancies. Um, from a commission services perspective for planned care, the performance is variable. Uh, colleagues will have noted in, in my previous updates that the English trust where we send our patients to, and that's the, that is the majority of our patients, the performance of um, long term backlogs for planned care is reducing much faster than it is in Wales. So at the time of writing, uh, we've only got 14 patients from Paris with our English providers um, waiting more than two years for uh, treatment. And there's some spinal patients up at uh, Robert Jones and Agnes Hunt. And from a planning perspective, the English NHS has been asked to ensure that there are no patients waiting more than 78 weeks by the end of this financial year. And that will include Paris patients in that um, uh, booking ask and that during 23 the 24 financial year the english target is to ensure that there's no patient waiting more than 65 weeks by the end of that financial year so those um increases in um targeted intervention and reduction in waiting times does have an impact on powers in terms of the number of, in terms of the, the speed by which patients are being treated in our english providers because they tend the english providers tend to treat Welsh patients to the English targets uh, just because it makes operational management much more easier to deliver. From a Welsh Commission perspective, the performance is, is really challenging. So the um, recovery is not as fast as, as with our English providers. And so the, again, at the time of writing, we've got we've still got around 580 patients waiting more than two years for treatment across Wales and that figure whilst is coming down is coming down very slowly as i said not helped by um, emergency care pressures and and at times patients need um having those procedures cancelled 
in in a res response to that, um, the Welsh um, government and health minister has set out revised targets for clearing um, those long waiters. And the aim now is that there are no patients waiting more than 104 weeks for um, treatment by the end of June. And that, that there are also no patients waiting more than 52 weeks for a new outpatient by the end of June. So that is a significant um, uh, target to uh, be achieved given some of the wait times that we've um, that I've described in, in the paper. Um, from a single cancer pathway perspective, where we do um, deliver the, the, this, the front of the pathways in, in Paris, our performance is good, but where we onward commission the treatment parts of the pathways um, across England and Wales, performance is challenged, um, largely due to an increase in both demand for those services and some staff turnover with those um, providers. And finally, uh, from a mental health perspective, our child and adult mental health services performance continues to remain strong, as does neurodevelopmental, but there are some challenges in the adult mental health services, particularly on interventions. Now, if I just pause there, Chair, and uh, see if Hayley would like to comment further on any of those um, broader points. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Just in terms of the last point that you've raised I, I, in um, mental health, obviously, um, the context of this is increasing demand and referrals upon the service uh, across all ages and also carrying quite substantial vacancies. And we've had some sickness issues across the teams. Um, just to give you a bit of a sense, if you look at the service overall, we're sort of talking about 20% vacancy rate, but actually in certain teams that can be higher. Um, so um, it, it is continuing to be a key uh, priority within the mental health team to um, attract and try and recruit people into working within Powys, and, and that's a key strategy and, and working alongside our uh, HR colleagues, the important role of the Health and Care Academy and other factors to, to help us deal with some of the recruitment challenges. But we've also had some substantial sickness issues in the team as well. Um, in relation to the nature of the demand as well and the referrals coming through, um, we're finding that in particular at the moment, so we do OK in terms of uh, some of the targets in, in relation to the assessment target within 28 days. But in relation to the interventions, we are finding that the um, patients require longer more complex interventions and also the number of uh, patients presenting with complex trauma has increased as well. So that is the nature of the demand as well as the numbers is slightly changing. We have got workforce challenges across the whole system, including uh, we discussed earlier as part of the Winter Resilience Plan, the impact of uh, the availability and gaps in social workers as well. So we have been um, prioritising urgent assess assessment, urgent assessment, duty, triage, etc. So it has had an impact. Um, I think that um, we're continuing to do what we can in terms of the service model and a couple of the examples you mentioned, CAMS, we're doing OK in terms of the performance, but the to maintain that has meant that we've had to rely on different ways of working like the rollout to the single point of access and also um, supported um, different approaches. We're looking at different skill mix approaches and how we can train the current practitioners to deal with the changing shape of some of the demand. Um, and I just wanted to mention particularly around neurodevelopmental. Yes, we rank first across Wales, but we have had a slight deterioration in quarter two from where we were. And um, we are really working very hard again, focusing uh, across all of these services on, on um, trying to deal with the backlog um, and the additional capacity we've secured through service improvement funding and others we're directing towards dealing with the key issues against the um, mental health measures and the targets to make sure patients get access as quickly as possible. But again, in the context of neurodevelopmental services, we're talking about an increase in referral demand there again of an average of 20 
uh, per month, which was the pre-COVID uh, position to an average of 50 um, at the end of quarter three. And that trend is currently continuing. So, um, yeah, uh, Steve, that's what I wanted to highlight. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. Annie. Th thank you, Chair. And then, then just in terms of the, the detailed um, pack, uh, colleagues will be familiar with, with the layout. So page two of the pack summarises the overall performance in, in that pie chart format. Pages five to ten um, describes in dashboard format the, our performance against the national outcome framework, the performance scorecards. Uh, that is then supported by a detailed performance assessment for each of the indicator that we um, measure ourselves against. And the volume at present reflects both the complexity of the NHS, but also the, the wide variety of um, services we provide and also the relationships that we, we hold with a variety of providers. Towards the end of the pack, there's some detailed information around waiting list performance by uh, the providers that we commission from. What we're seeking to do um, in the, at the turn of the new financial year, board members have approved our integrated performance framework. That becomes operational um, for, for, the, for the new financial year. So we will be streamlining via a, a more exception methodology the information coming to board. We will still have to report against uh, some of the key planning and performance indicators like the quadruple aims and the ministerial outcome measures and any other key key indicators falling out of the guidance. But um, with one eye on, um, say, the uh, shortening of, of, the, of the current pack that is that has been produced so far. Thank so you. I'll pause there, Chair, for comments. Yeah, no, yeah. that's really, really helpful. Uh, uh, thank you, Steve, uh, and uh, for a masterly summary of what is a very large and uh, a very detailed report. Uh, there are a few um, board colleagues that want to come in with questions, so I'll go firstly to Kirsty. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, Steve, the paper gives a very, very comprehensive snapshot of where we are and some of the reasons and, and some of the reasons why we're, we are where we are. Perhaps the paper might in future benefit from outlining some actions and some key areas that the book that we are taking as an organisation to address those situations. So, for example, you know, our ambulance performance on red calls is shocking. We all know the reasons for that, but it would be useful to understand what steps we're taking uh, to mitigate, to, first of all, to have conversations with the provider and what steps we can or cannot take to mitigate uh, the risks associated with poor levels of performance in that area. Uh, the single cancer pathway, you note uh, performance and compliance is a concern. It would be useful to know what steps we're taking to address those concerns and whether you know there's a likelihood of imp uh, um, uh, imp improvement as a result of that. And then finally, on the issue of um, uh, non-urgent commission services, the inequality, it seems, continues to grow uh, from a place that wasn't very good to start with. Uh, Steve, you bring papers forward and every paper you bring forward has the bullet point that we are exploring opportunities to repatriate. I'm just wondering, have we succeeded in repatriating anybody and you know whether that is truly a realistic option uh, given uh, the performance of Welsh providers and whether it's truly realistic and, uh, and capable of moving our patients into different providers so they're not waiting so long and I'd be grateful whether you could outline what work you're doing to plan for the minister's new targets and whether you think at this stage those targets have any realistic chance of being met. I'd hate to raise public expectation if we know at this point that we are not going to be able to do that. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, Steve. Uh, th there are a few people wanting to come in, Steve. So I know it's a big to, but um, uh, 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 very important questions from Kirsty. Do, do you want to come back on that initially, and then we'll yeah. go to others? Yeah, we'll do. Um, yeah, in relation to ambulance and actions, fair call, um, Kirsty. We do need. I do need to strengthen the actions that um, the ambulance service that are taking on our behalf, and, and describe those in in the paper more to give some some assurance that the um, position and interventions are being looked into, but also more capacity or revised uh, pathways and so on and so forth are being um, 
instigated to try and improve performance. No, Carol, I, I don't know whether, did you want to just come in on that specific issue at this stage? Did I see? Yeah, it, 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 yeah if, if I may, I do have a report a bit later on on the agenda uh, reporting from ESC. There is an improvement plan uh, around um, ambulance uh, services. Uh, the really core, core issue is the number of hours lost by ambulances outside of the ED department. That is, you know, there's lots to do, but if that one could, that dial could be moved. Um, and so that plan is uh, BA has been developed and is being monitored through ESC. Um, there are um, step down um, targets. What I mean by that is uh, health board chief execs have agreed a four hour uh, maximum handover window um, at this stage. And then because you're quite right on the trajectories, we should be expecting that to reduce to three to two to get back to that 15 minutes, which is, you know, feels as if it's been a very long way away. But there is a plan in place for that and we review that progress at each ESC meeting um, and actually in between, you know, I've had an update now uh, from the uh, ambulance service chief exec on that. So there are processes around that. I think we do need to bring this out much more vividly uh, in the report and uh, hence uh, Steve indicating that the report formats will will change. Thank you, Carol. Um, on the single cancer pathway, I mean, capacity is is an issue, um, Kirsty, and and uh, with the increase in referral demand, a lot of ulcer cancer referrals get downgraded. So there is a potential that there might there may need to be better streamlining up front around um, the quality of the referral in the first place. As a result of um, of performance, providers both in England and Wales have been asked to improve cancer performance. So as part of the RTP process and, and just general commissioner provider relationships, we're keen to understand what additional capacity and actions they're putting into place with a recovery trajectory, because our patients then will receive that um, improved um, access as a result. And there's a, there's a lot going on in terms of cancer pathway, um, rapid diagnostics and so on and so forth, and additional capacity coming online. So I'm, I'm quietly optimistic that um, performance will improve and, and we will share recovery trajectories when, once we've been through that round of uh, commissioner provider relationships with, with our providers. Um, for non-urgent commission services, you're right, the inequity and difference between the response times in England and Wales, it is of huge concern. Uh, both to, you know to everyone within the health board, but particularly that for those for those patients waiting. So the minute you know in Wales they have said that those long waits have got to be eradicated by June. So so that that is a di directive to mobilise more capacity and, and treat patients to achieve that aim. Why it's so bad it is a, is a complicated um, factor, uh, Kirsty. You know that there was a there was a difference in waiting this performance before the pandemic and um, then the way services were restored during the pandemic. There was also a different pace on um, between England and Wales in that respect. The English NHS is significantly much bigger provider wise. So patients do um, transfer between providers and also a very different relationship with the private sector in terms of insourcing and outsourcing that hasn't always been that prevalent in Wales. Um, so that, that is a difficult one, but but we want as soon as we can um, the position to improve for, for all, all of our residents. Um, repatriation, yes, I, I do. Um, I do um, reference that quite quite often. I mean, we have the facilities in Paris, as you know, and they're underutilized. So so it's an it is an absolute opportunity to improve the whole ethos of care close to the home and use the facilities that, that, that we've got that, that are of very good standard. We have made some improvement to um, utilisation and we have repatriated some patients back. So some endoscopy patients that have come back from Comtaf that would have otherwise waited a bit longer, they, they've come back in, into Brecon. We've also repatriated some follow-up waiting lists um, back into Paris, say for respiratory and so on, so on and so forth. But there's much more that we can do. 
you know, we, we need, um, we've got those day case services for endoscopy and, and, and the two theatre suites and plans in situ for development of, of an equivalent North Paris offer. The constraints that we've got is staffing both as a as a provider and, and the volume of staff that we've got at our disposal. But if we need um, consultants or anaesthetists to undertake those um, procedures, we don't actually employ any at present. We rely on those um, district general hospitals and the health boards across England and Wales to supply us those staff. We have. Sorry, got... Steve. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm very conscious of time, and we've got quite a number of others wanting to okay. come in on this agenda item. Uh, 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 Kirsty, um, anything, uh, uh, any response from you? Are you satisfied, or would you like to come back? I'll pick it up with Steve, given the time constraints. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry to 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 uh, interrupt uh, rather abruptly. Uh, so uh, if we if we could take a few uh, questions uh, uh, so that we can make best use of the time available to us. So I'll go to Mark, to Chris, and then to Jen, uh, please in that order, please, Mark. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point in terms of we get in better with data recording and. Um, the data we're capturing, but I think it's then converting that into, well, how are we using that data to inform our prioritisation and actually achieve what we're seeking to achieve? So I think that's work to be done. A um, couple of general points, if I call specific points around page 38 and the table there, Steve. I wonder if you could just talk us through um, some explanation behind that, because I think there's some concern in issues in terms of data and prioritisation um, around that um, data set. So what should we be looking for and what we're going to get eventually from this table? Yeah, yeah thank you. Thanks, Mark. So, so this is in relation. Sorry, 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 Steve. I, 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 if we if we squeeze in it at two or three questions okay. and then if you can. So uh, we're going next. Uh, to um, uh, to Chris, please. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for an, uh, an interesting paper, which is very comprehensive. Um, my question relates to um, the primary care um, commentary, um, where it mentions about the loss of data uh, due to a cyber attack. Um, these are becoming more and more frequent issues and that on there. One is I just wanted to seek that no, it was no patient data that had been breached. And then also of what mitigations were put in place to readdress this issue um, because um, uh, we need to ensure the robustness of IT services and if there's any learning to be made from that on there. Thank you, Chair. OK, do you want to come back on those, Steve? And then we've got an, a couple of others that uh, want to come in. Yeah, thank you. So, so Mark, yeah. Data and improvement and insight. Absolutely. So uh, we've spent quite a lot of time on, on, on data, improving um, reporting, capture, oversight and so on and so forth and we are looking now to develop that so what with benchmarking and and really you know yeah we, we know some of our areas are around workforce access flow and, and then we'll, we'll come up on um, around the wider impact of of finance so, so it's making that uh, that next step really to get that business intelligence know our services and then seek to you know deploy our um, resources to get the best outcome for patients, so that's what we're aiming for. Um, in terms of slide 38, this is the follow-up um, issue that we've uh, flagged as a health board. Um, and what we're, we're what we're seeking to achieve there is that um, the validation of follow-ups is um, completely up to date, so that we know that those follow-ups are both valid if the pathways are um, dormant in terms of the patients have actually been dis discharged but the records have not been closed down. Why is that? And and go through a method of of closing down those records. So we're we're doing some data cleansing. In other in other words, of our follow up position, 
what it will lead to is a better oversight of data quality, a potential improvement in standard operating procedures, uh, operating around um, across clinical staff, admin staff, and um, information performance functions. Because what we want is our is our data to be an accurate, up to date reflection of of the number of patients waiting. This is not as this is not a problem unique to, unique to Paris, by the way. But we we picked up on it, on it early, and um, we're, we're moving through it. Um, Chris, in terms of um, primary care loss of data, I don't know whether uh, um, whether Carol or, or Haley want to comment on this one. Thank you. Happy to Sorry, in. microphone Sorry. couldn't couldn't find the button. My apologies. Um, uh, Chris, I think we will uh, look to bring a separate report through on the impact of the cyber uh, issue uh, in a in a board committee, if if we may. Um, just for some uh, background, this is a service that is provided. Um, uh, by a, an independent uh, organisation, an advanced that is in the public domain, related to the Adastra system that uh, runs services, uh, computer services, both in uh, Wales and England. Um, uh, there was a uh, recovery process put in place in in Wales, uh, of which our colleagues participated, uh, which has been very helpful. Um, and that helped to just make sure that access to patient records uh, was as uh, comprehensive as it could be for the clinicians dealing with um, uh, patients in front of them. Because um, during the cyber attack, the system needed to be um, uh, closed down and isolated. So that was the issue about the access to patient data. So. Um, I'm uh, I'm not uh, I don't think we have yet received the full impact report from the uh, organization and from Digital Health and Care Wales, but I think we should be bringing that back through probably uh, chair to uh, a, uh, a meeting of the delivery and performance committee who I think have been overseeing uh, all issues related to cyber. I just wanted to give that indication. Thank you. So we'll, we'll take that as an action and uh, for, from from this meeting. I'm conscious that uh, I'm very aware that the clock is beating us on this particular agenda, agenda item, but we do have two um, uh, two others wanting to come in, uh, were Ronnie and Ian. I'll take them both together. Uh, if I could ask, uh, as best as you can, uh, to be brief, both in terms of the question and the response, uh, that would help our timekeeping. Thank you. Ronnie. Thank you, Chair. I will be brief. Um, given that uh, our flu vac rates are a lot lower than desired and we're waiting for the figures to be validated, um, are we maximising our efforts to ensure that staff receive, as many staff as possible, receive flu vaccination? Thank you. And Ian. Uh, sim similar questions on 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 flu. I mean, this has been um, an issue um, for me. It's it's in the preventative space, isn't it? So we need to maximise our opportunities here, and we've struggled uh, continually, uh, despite our best efforts, to get these uh, rates up. I just wondered whether we need to be thinking about a different approach to vaccination in order to get that. And allied to that, I guess a, a technical question in terms of. Is it too late already this year? We've have we had the uh, the 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 flu through, and that's contributing to our current pressures, or 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 should we be still maximising our efforts? That that was on page twenty one of the large report. My second question is in relation to page eighty four, which is the the concerns and um, uh, uh, complaints. Um, it's great to see the improvement. Um, but I, I didn't understand the, the graph. I could not relate the numbers in red. They didn't seem to to uh, to relate to the um, to the to the numbers on the on on, on the graph. Um, uh, and and the other thing, the the um, I'm struggling to get the page up now. But the 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 bar itself seemed to be saying two things. From memory, it was total complaints and complaints. Uh, responded to within 30 days. Well, it can't be both of those things. 
uh, in the same figure because they seem to me to be different figures unless I'm being uh, particularly daft on that. OK, thank you. Uh, as I say, we're going to have to um, c conclude this this item uh, uh, reasonably quickly. Uh, uh, so, uh, Mererid, if you come in in relation to the vaccinations, then who will take uh, Ian's question um, about the uh, the information and the 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 the, 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 the charts? Steve, OK, yeah, so yeah, I uh, uh, yeah Russell. Yeah, so in terms of flu vaccination, there is variation in uptake according to different eligible groups. So for staffing, um, all health boards across Wales have seen a much lower uptake in uh, flu vaccine for staff this year, albeit, albeit, you know, in terms of uptake as average around 55 to 60 percent across sort of Wales. We have taken a slightly different approach um, this year, bearing in mind uh, last year, flu uptake rates um, for staff weren't as high as what we wanted either. And this year there's been two formal invitations to staff um, to when 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 they were attending for COVID and they were offer, offered flu and then just before Christmas um, a further letter uh, was sent to staff members with an appointment as well. We have identified that some staff members do receive the vaccine either at GP or outside the health board area so we're collating that information currently and in addition to that uh, champions have been out to um, sites as well for the health board um, to offer the vaccination. We did discuss it nationally across DPH groups last week with the CMO as well and I, I think there's areas around uh, communications and behavioural insight work that we're looking at collectively and how we can apply that ready for um, next season and just to say it's not too late to have the flu um, vaccine. Thank you. Thank you. Last word to you, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, so, Ian, yeah, I've got the chart in front of me and it may be, I think it said we need to improve the descriptors on, on that chart. So, in, in a nutshell, we're measuring the number of complaints that we've received on the left hand axis. And then on the right hand axis, we're using a uh, percentage to say how quickly we responded to the to those. Um, but I'll improve the, the um, narrative on that chart. Okay. And the figures and the figures in red. The figures in red are that, um, say, for example, in Q3, we had 137 um, complaints and we responded. 83 percent of them were responded within the within the time scale of 30 working days. So I don't know, Claire, do you want to add anything to thank that? You. No, that's fine. Thank you. OK, OK, thank well, you. thank you. Uh, um, uh, clearly, uh, a very, very key and important report uh, and uh, a very uh, important response and, and discussion. Uh, um, I, I think particularly uh, um, it will be important to take forward, as you as you indicated very early on in the discussion, Steve, that further development of this reporting um, and particularly around uh, uh, the, 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 the way and the content of assurance that's brought to the board. Going back to uh, Kirsty's uh, um, questions earlier, you know, how does the board receive that assurance about not just what is being done, but actually the effect of what's being done and whether act, whether it's working or not. Uh, and so, uh, um, you know, uh, so yeah, be uh, look look forward to working with you uh, as as to how we might develop this further, both in terms of a a, a process and a um, and a template, as it were. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're a little bit behind time, so we'll try to make up a little bit of time, uh, but we move on now to financial matters again. Uh, we've already had a forward look uh, in relation to our um, financial context, but we have before us now the actual position uh, in month nine and uh, and over to Pete. Thank you, Chair. So the finance report is included in all the papers for the board in the usual format. I will just go through some of the key messages and key highlights and I'll reference the um, the page within the slide deck report as included. So first of all, on page two, our month nine revenue position is an overspend of 5.9 million. We do continue to hold our forecast year end deficit position at seven and a half million. And that's based on a number of assumptions around the management of risks and realisation of opportunities towards the end of the financial year. 
in relation to our capital position um, against our capital resource limit of 9.647 million. We've spent 3.293 million to date and our forecast is to deliver that um, position uh, and deliver a break even. If I take it to page three, this summarizes our, our, our spend by our key spend areas. Our key areas of focus and attention, as has been reported in, in, in all previous boards and committees, includes continuing healthcare, our commissioning position, a prescribing position, and there's our ongoing position within there in relation to variable pay. On page four, this monitors the action taken in relation to our financial and our financial recovery actions, as reported via the financial and performance executive subgroup. On this, on this page, it details the in-year actions which are contributing to our overall seven and a half million forecast deficit and the impact of those actions moving into the next year. And it's really crucial that we continue the actions in this area and continue to focus on what we can do to reduce our spend and reduce our run rate as we move into 23 to 24. On page nine, there's um, there's a detail in relation to our our ongoing COVID response and our and our sorry our exceptional cost pressure items. Really important to note that on this table, as I as I mentioned under the IEMTP agenda, that the ongoing COVID response costs, which are in, in forecast to be 6.9 million for us, there will not be funding to support these actions going forward into the new year. So that we focus on these areas to identify exit strategy, mitigating actions and areas and ways in which we can reduce those costs. That's similarly the position in relation to energy, again, as referenced in the IMTP section earlier. On page 10 includes the forecast in detail for against key, key areas that totals um, seven and a half million. And again, we're just making it clear there to the board that um, uh, the total operational pressure of 15.1 million, the offset in relation to our ongoing COVID response, which is being funded at present, that delivers against that 7.5 million with the risks and issues that I flagged earlier. And, and just really to make that link back now from, from this financial year and our forecast 7.5 million deficit and how that links into the, the conversation on IMTP earlier. Again, just to state, it's absolutely crucial that we identify those actions to mitigate and reduce costs and reduce run rate in all areas wherever possible. Um, as, I, as I stated, the energy and COVID response funding will not be available next year. Um, that has a significant impact on our financial plan and outlook for next year. And as we know, we're moving into next year with that underlying deficit position as stated. And again, just a reminder of the 2.5% expectation around savings. So that challenging environment, we are going to need the whole board focus, clear prioritisation and decision making and being absolutely clear of the impact of those actions as we, as we look to reduce our, cross, our costs across all areas. And I'll pause there, the usual full detail of our monitor returns, etc., including all dependencies. Happy to take any comments and questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Pete. Um, any comments, observations, contributions, please indicate. Looks like you've stunned everyone into absolute delirium, Pete. Uh, so uh, um, I will just pause a little longer, uh, just in case anyone does want to come in on this important report. Uh, Carol, please. Yes, I'm probably stating the obvious, but but I will I will do this. Um, uh, Pete, just to confirm that if we don't break even this year, we will not have met our statutory duty. Yes, correct. So um, uh, it, it, just for the avoidance of any of any doubt, um, very disappointing uh, position for us. But as I referred to earlier, Chair, um, in the, the, this is on the backdrop of this health board delivering its statutory duty every year for the last seven years. Um, and so this is pretty exceptional times that we're in. But there, there are some uh, serious matters in relation to not being able to meet that duty. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will bring Mark in, uh, but just just on, on the back of that, Carol, perhaps you or Pete might just want to give a reflection on what the implications of that are and will be, because you've already reported to us earlier in this meeting uh, that the um, the likely position next year and indeed beyond next year uh, will also put us in a, in, in a place where we won't be able to meet that statutory 
requirement. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's the so <laughs> what question, really. Yeah, perhaps if I start and then and then Pete, Pete come in. So you know, I, I've heard in many different places from many different commentators, oh, it's OK in the health service, you get your you know your your deficit sort of wiped out that 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 is that is not that is not the case uh, largely in that if we um, overspend and we have a deficit at the end of the year uh, we do start with that opening um, difficulty in into next year and ultimately the challenge is we have a reduced amount of funding to be able to spend on the, the health and well-being of the population. We also, uh, a secondary issue, but a really key issue is uh, we have a, a huge amount more scrutiny and challenge uh, from, from uh, government. Um, and potentially, you know, if we start to lose our reputation as an organisation that can balance its books and deliver its priorities, you know, that starts to bring into question, you know, some of the strategic developments that we wish to to take forward. Now, that's me being rather gloomy, I'm afraid, <laughs> Chair. But, you know, in, in so doing, we know that we have got opportunities to uh, improve services and, and reduce costs at the same time. Um, uh, and we will have to consider how we change the shape of services to do just that. Um, and I think that's a very serious piece of work for us as a board to undertake um, uh, with our population and other stakeholders. So, Pete, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add. Uh, thank you, Carol. I think you've covered it. I, I think, it, yeah, it is simply um, we failed against the statutory duty if we don't break even. That will lead to our accounts being qualified. That will lead to potential increased intervention and, and all that comes with that, as, as Carol has described. And I think it generally um, it's a absolute requirement for all of us to make sure that we allocate our resources in the best possible way to deliver those best outcomes for the population. And that's what we have to focus on. And that's what we have to, to be doing in everything we do, every single person within the health board. Thank you. And, and might it be worth also just adding that we we are operating in a context where all other health boards are experiencing similar challenges. Uh, and so it's not that Powys is an outlier uh, or, or is exceptional in, in this regard. Uh, um, and uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's the, the water in which we swim currently. So, uh, uh, so th thank you. Uh, Mark, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, the, those are very helpful summaries from Pete and Carol in terms of is what if and you know, we are where we are in terms of the output. Um, but question is, in terms of we actually still seem to be taking the view that some of the cost exposures, I think on page um, nine, are actually viewed as shared risk. Is that sort of realistic in the current context or are we essentially going to need to bear those um, shared risks ourselves? But Thank you, Mark. No, those those risks are are not risks any longer. We've had the level of funding confirmed um, based on our forecast at month eight, so they are covered within our position in relation to the exceptional cost items and the ongoing COVID response. But but we'll not be going into the new financial year is the key point. Yeah, I, I think that's w where my sort of question was coming from. Um, but thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Anyone else want to come in on this agenda item? If not, then we're asked to discuss and note the position uh, at the end of month five uh, um, and particularly uh, note the uh, deficit position and the, uh, the, the forecasted uh, deficit position that's been brought to our attention uh, within, of course, that wider context of the financial outlook um, and so uh, we have discussed it uh, we have noted it and unless anyone puts something in the chat pane uh, um, to the contrary um, i'll take that as read and move on okay thank you so we move to the next agenda item which is the corporate risk register and um, Helen is going to take us uh, through the revisions uh, that have recently um, uh, been made to the register. Thank you. 
Thank you, Carl, and morning, everybody. Lovely to be with you. Um, so the board last received the corporate risk register in November of last year, and at that same meeting, uh, you also considered and approved the revised risk framework and the risk, <coughs> excuse me, the risk appetite statement. So pleased to provide uh, to you today, and a big thanks to both the corporate governance team, but also the executive team and their staff who are the risk owners of these. Uh, and and uh, I may well draw some colleagues in, uh, depending on the questions that come through as well. So pleased to provide in front of you today both the updated corporate risk register which is attached to appendix one that's been updated as at the end of December um, there is no substantive change to the risk descriptors themselves although there are some changes um, to the content of the risks and I'll just outline those to you briefly uh, so risk 004 uh, which is in relation to the urgent and emergency health and social care system. You'll have noted in the report, and we had quite a substantial discussion earlier on the agenda in terms of the winter resilience report, the scoring hasn't changed, but you'll note the comments that there has been some very robust discussion within the executive team uh, an executive committee and I think the reality is given the system pressures that we heard about earlier on and all the mitigating actions that are taking place um, that risk score could well change arguably on a week to week basis. The executive team's taken the decision not to change it at this point uh, given the mitigations in place um, and particularly the ones around the winter resilience plan and the gold command structure that we again talked about a little earlier on but just just to note that point I think that's one that will continue to stay under particular review uh, as we of the others of course. Also just to draw your attention to risk eight um, that is in relation to demand and capacity pressures in the primary care system that has reduced um, from a score of 16 to 20 stays within our red category uh, and absolutely reflects the current pressures and I hope um, members will see that the updated uh, areas in the register in red uh, reflect the updates and the, the changing actions and mitigations that are there. The second part of the report then outlines the risk categories. Uh, these have been uh, identified and based on the board's risk appetite that you discussed and agreed back in November and have been reviewed by the executive team as well. So uh, really, Carl, seeking the board's um, kind of acknowledgement of the corporate risk register and of course, welcome any questions or uh, uh, comments that you may have in terms of them being a true and accurate reflection of the current risks for the health board uh, and then the endorsement of the risk categories again pending any questions or comments anyone may have thank you thank you uh, Simon would you like to come in please yeah just just to seek some clarification on risk 004 in the more detailed report it's indicating and a, 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 an increase to 25 risk score in the overarching report it's it, it, the narrative refers to it staying at 20 so just i just wanted to check which, which which of those and i think in the diagram it's positioned at the 25 highest level so i just wanted to clarify which of those two my sense is it, it is possibly at 25 um g given the narrative and what we're seeing Thanks, Simon. And apologies, we've got an administrative error there. It is at 20. Uh, the discussion around the executive table was, is it 20 or 25? Ah, so okay. I'll take that back and make sure that we amend that and correct it. Uh, so apologies for that. But at this point in time, we've left it sat at 20. OK, thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to contribute uh, and come in? Uh, uh, Carol, uh, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. If I can just pick up from where Simon was. Um, uh, Simon, the reality is we really struggled with were we a 20 or 25? And, you know, we got into the diff uh, the, the discussion about uh, what we can directly influence, uh, what we have direct control over and what we can try and influence. And it, it relates to some of the discussion we had earlier on the performance and, and, and you know, ambulances outside ED departments and things like that. So um, there is no number between 20 and 25 using this rating. So um, uh, and of course, proximity and timing, certainly for a couple of weeks, it did really feel as though we were uh, we were more at 25 than 20. But those actions that the teams uh, and in particular, you know, Haley and other colleagues have put in place uh, felt that we, you know, it, we probably weren't there at at all of the time. So that's why a little bit more narrative um, uh, in, in Helen's report this time. Um, uh, not an exact science, but the fact that we had a really good debate, I think, uh, I hope shows that in terms of risk management, um, that is um, uh, very, very active. 
really helpful. Thank you, Carol. And Chris? Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just seeking clarification on CRR009, um, the cyber attack. Was that the same incident that had been discussed previously? It's nothing new. It's not a new um, incident. Carol, I can see you nodding there. <laughs> Do you want to come in? Yeah, just 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 two two things. Yes, that that is the 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 main incident, Chris. I think there is something now in the world of cyber. I'm, I'm learning lots, you know. Uh, uh, we never had this 20, 30 years ago, did we? But um, is, you know, I think the industry is recognising that cyber attacks are likely to happen. Um, we'll put all uh, the, the, the measures in to try to prevent them. But the key thing is that no guarantees they won't happen again. It's then about how quickly things can be recovered. Uh, and I think that's going to be now the 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 real test for not just the you know the health service, but every uh, sector that uses technology is how you how you uh, the prevention, but the prevention doesn't stop absolutely everything. How you respond. So that that's that bit there for for us, Chris. And, and there's more work for us to do on this aspect. Thank you. can't see anyone else indicating that they want to contribute. Please do uh, if you would like to come in. OK, but, but perhaps I just might uh, make an observation. It's, it just seems to me that, you know, uh, just looking at the, the, the dashboard um, and uh, I think it's quite a salutary thing as a board uh, to note uh, that all but one of our um, risks is outside and some well outside of our risk appetite. Uh, and um, that's quite that's quite an uncomfortable place to be, isn't it? And uh, um, and I suppose the question then, and I think it relates to the, the conversation we had just a few minutes ago about what does risk management mean uh, in, in, you know, clearly there's a, there's a lot of good stuff going on. Um, but what what would we expect? What would we want this to look like when we next meet or when we next look at it? Uh, and what direction of travel would we want to 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 see reflected there? And and how can that kind of uh, in assurance information then uh, be reflected both in this report and in associated reports? Um, so. Uh, um, yeah, it, it's a uh, uh, so please, please don't misunderstand me. I, I know there's a lot and lot of very, very um, effective work going on in terms of risk mitigation and risk management, uh, but it's, get, it's just get, getting that sense of the so what question. What should be expected as a result of that, um, if, if, if that makes sense? Thanks, Carl. That's a really helpful comment, and, and I agree with you. And I think as we continue to to develop and mature there's some work to do around our broader board assurance framework and how all of these things tie together and interrelate so i think there's a a little bit of work to do there i, th I think generally speaking one of the challenges with any corporate risk register because these are the big risks that knock over the delivery of our both in your plans and strategy, there are times when actions don't always appear to make change immediately. So I think foreseeing a target risk is one thing, foreseeing the target time scale it is quite challenging, but that's perhaps something that we can continue to, you know, kind of consider and, and look at within the wider board assurance framework and integrated performance reporting uh, work that's being done. So, um, but, but we'll certainly take the comments and, uh, and consider that as we move forwards. Okay. Well, thank you. If 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 there are no uh, other contributions, um, uh, so we are asked to review and endorse the updated risk categories um, uh, as they appear in front of us uh, and how they uh, um, relate to and reflect the risk appetite statement and and, and so on. Um, so, and we're also asked to uh, ensure that what we have in front of us is a complete and true reflection of the health board's current risk levels and risk uh, um, uh, and risk management. So uh, 
With that in mind, again, please indicate uh, if you're not content to receive and endorse this report. In which case that is received and endorsed unanimously. Thank you. Um, delighted as always to have uh, Katie with us from uh, the CHC from the Community Health Council and uh, uh, Katie over to you for uh, your report uh, that we received and uh, uh, received gratefully. Thank you. Yeah, Carl, um, <clears throat> thank you very much. I hope my report was fairly self-explanatory, but I just thought I'd just pick up um, a few uh, a few additional uh, comments, make, make a few additional comments. Um, this, since we last met, we've actually started to do more engagement and more visits, which has been brilliant, actually. And I think both members and the communities have welcomed uh, that sort of increased activity. We have uh, undertaken a visit at Brecon Hospital and at Astrid Gunlice Hospital, uh, and we were, pl it was, we were planned to visit um, SAF uh, on the 31st of January, but given the current uh, pressures on the system, uh, they've asked if we can postpone. But I'd like to thank um, everybody who was involved in those visits. It's quite some time since we actually went out and visited hospitals because of COVID. So it uh, took a bit of getting used to, I think, in, in the organising and the arrangements, but it was uh, hugely beneficial. Uh, and those reports will be shared with you. Um, the question of the month this uh, this month is around people's experiences of 111. Um, we're getting the feeling now, I think generally the public are rather surveyed out. Um, and so I think it's just a case of reflecting um, about how we actually get uh, the, the best response to our questions. The 111 survey hasn't um, resulted in a huge number of um, issues being raised and yet we know as the CHC and, and as you've touched upon earlier in the meeting that there are people who are experiencing challenges accessing that 111 service. Um, so we're going to we're gonna, we'll look at reviewing how we actually um, engage with people to understand the complexities of some, some of the experiences that they've had. With regard to service change, we had an executive committee a couple of weeks ago, um, and I think it's important just to note that the executive committee um, asked me to write on their behalf to the chief um, emergency ambulance uh, commissioner uh, to highlight and to remind uh, ESC of the, um, the decision that Power CHC had made around the engagement and the consultation for the proposed changes to the Wales Air Ambulance Service. Um, and I think the second thing just to raise from that executive committee was uh, discussions on the CHC uh, involvement in the engagement uh, and consultation on the proposed closure to the Gilwyn branch surgery. So those are two significant pieces of work that we are engaged with both the community and yourselves uh, as, as the health board. Um, the advocacy service, um, there is still, a, you know, still a lot of complaints, but it is fairly um, constant at the moment. And I'd just like to also draw your attention to the fact that there's a very high percentage um, in total of local resolution, which I think is really, really positive. I know that my advocate and um, the Putting Things Right team meet on a weekly basis, and that's proved hugely beneficial to try and work through some of those complaints and some of those issues so that the individuals uh, and, and neither your team nor my team have to sort of go and escalate it uh, further, uh, ultimately to the Ombudsman. So I think that's really, really positive. Um, with regard to um, the CVB, it's now going to be known as Slice, uh, which is voice. Um, I've been and my team have been strengthening our relationship with the local authorities, as obviously social care will now come under the umbrella of Slice from the 1st of April 2023. I'd just like to finally draw um, members' attention to the fact that there are three quite important consultations out uh, at the moment uh, in relation to CLICE, the CVB, and those relate to access to premises, they relate to service change and they relate to representations. So we'll need to work all of that through once the outcome of those consultations is known, but um, I'd obviously encourage 
members individually um, or as a board to consider uh, responding to those consultations. The closing date is the 6th of March. Um, and that will, the outcome of that will really influence how we will work closely, continue to work closely together uh, for the communities of Powys with PTHB and Powys County Council. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you, Katie, uh, again, for a, a, a very helpful um, uh, presentation of, of your paper and additional comments. Uh, um, we do have a few minutes for discussion if anyone would like to to come in i know that robert uh, you'd like to come in so please do thank you um katie i just wondered uh under the new structure slice uh is it going to reproduce the ge geography of, of, of the old organization particularly interested you know whether powers will retain its integrity and so on Thank you. I mean, obviously, the, the sort of specifics are still being worked through, but there is an undoubted commitment to the principle of the new organisation being local, regional and national. Um, and so um, trying to unpack what local, regional, you'll see, understand what national means, um, but local is uh, going to be local authority um, boundaries, regional be the RPB, um, and of course, Powys therefore has both a local from a local authority perspective and a regional from an RPB perspective. Um, so I'm in discussions about um, ensuring that the differences um, across Powys. I mean, we know that the pathways, for example, are extremely different between North Powys and South Powys. Is that actually how, how we can actually make sure that the local element to Powys is, is, is not Powys itself, but more likely to be cluster areas or I'd like to try and move away from the concept of shires, but uh, but at the moment everything is very much based on Montgomery and R and B and um, 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 Radnorshire. Sorry, Radnorshire. <laughs> um, so uh, so so yeah. So we're working all of that way, working that through. But I mean, as a team, we are very committed to making sure that we continue to work. Um, at a very local level and work with organisations that are working at a very local level. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Anyone else want to uh, enter into the discussion uh, um, in response to Katie's report? No, I can't see anyone indicating. So uh, a big thank you, Katie, to you and your colleagues for um, very, very important work. And uh, um, and we look forward to continuing working with you in both the current guys and in the new guys. Uh, uh, and uh, um, yeah, we'll, we'll work that through together. But uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so we're asked to uh, note uh, this report, which uh, I assume we do. Uh, please indicate otherwise if you think otherwise. Um, no indication. So we do note the report and we say thank you for it. So we move on to uh, the assurance reports of the board's committees. Um, and we'll take these one by one. I'll invite chairs of the committees to offer any additional comments uh, should they wish to. Um, and, uh, and then we'll... Uh, We'll, we'll open up the discussion uh, within the time constraints. So uh, uh, we turn first of all to the charitable funds that I chair. Um, uh, I don't have any additional comments to the report. We've already, um, as part of this meeting, uh, approved the annual report and accounts. Uh, and as you'll see in the report, um, uh, there were various uh, um, um, uh, uh, we, we approved uh, various uh, applications for funding and so on. Uh, but uh, um, if anyone would like to come in with any question or comment, please do. And either I or Pete will respond. No, so we move on to the uh, executive committee report. Carol, any additional comments? Uh, no, Chair. Um... Uh, the issues that I wished to be escalated have formed the formal paper uh, presented earlier and uh, uh, winter. So happy to take any questions on the rest of the report. 
Are there any questions, observations or comments um, in relation to the executive committee report? No, so we move on to Kirsty and to Pex. Thank you. Uh, nothing, nothing included to add that isn't included in the written report. Right, and there are no matters for escalation, Kirsty. Uh, that's right. Uh, so, uh, but any any comments? Anyone want to come in? No, and then so we go then to workforce and culture and to Ian. Um, anything from you, Ian? Um, nothing further to add apart from one thing really, which is it's been really good to, to work with Deborah, particularly in relation to one of our biggest risks, which is recruitment and retention. And it's been great to note the focus on not just a huge amount of work that, that is ongoing, but this focus on um, what, what, what are the things that are working best for us and we can do more of. So that's been that's been a, a really good discussion offline. I look forward to some of that work coming through in the committee and being able to report back to the board in due course. Right, but but no specific matters of escalation to, to the board today, Ian? No. No, OK. Uh, would anyone you. like to, anyone like to uh, uh, make a comment or ask a question uh, in relation to workforce and culture? No, so we go on then to the um, uh, to. Oh yes, Mark, uh, would you like to come in in relation to workforce and culture? Thank you, Jay. It was just to pick up on the um, pleas to see that an offer has been made for an occupational health lead. Um, I think we've raised it previously in other committees about the importance and the fragility of that service and just wanted to say how positive that was. So hopefully that offer's taken up. Thank you. Thank you. So we move on then to the Joint Committee's report. Uh, um, Carol, um, any comments? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, colleagues. So uh, earlier on the item, or well, two items, one on the integrated medium term plan and then uh, one on performance. Um, both of those items were relevant to the joint committees. Um, uh, there is a, um, a chair's brief uh, provided in relation to, to ESC, um, and you'll see some of the uh, elements that I mentioned earlier about handover uh, improvement plan meetings and trajectories, etc. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, uh, Katie, in her report, just raised the emergency medical retrieval uh, and transport service, so EMERTS, um, that remains a key uh, agenda item in ESC and uh, an item that um, I, I'm, I'm personally uh, very focused on uh, in order that um, uh, members of our population are able to fully engage and contribute to what the service might look like uh, going forward should there be uh, a case for change. So I wanted to flag that. In relation to, to WISC, uh, there have been a number of uh, discussions in, in terms of the integrated commissioning plan, which forms part of our uh, IMTP. Uh, we are getting closer to a plan that can be recommended uh, to the board as part of the IMTP, but some additional work is taking place uh, on that. And then, Chair, if I may, um, we have uh, this week received a letter. I have received a letter from um, the Director General um, uh, in Welsh Government uh, to indicate that there will be a review of the functions of WISC, ESC and the National Collaborative Commissioning Unit. That is a commitment that was made in a Healthier Wales um, and uh, has been delayed as a result of the pandemic. I think we'll have quite a lot to contribute to, to that uh, review, particularly given you know, the shape of our own organisation in terms of the uh, level of commissioning that we uh, we do. So uh, that's it really uh, from uh, from the uh, joint committee perspective. Thank you, Karen. Just just to add to that, uh, a similar letter came out to chairs. Uh, I haven't had a chance to, uh, uh, to, to, to share that with you yet, uh, Carol, but uh, yeah, similar to came out to chairs alerting uh, 
chairs uh, to the fact that the, that um, uh, a provider had been appointed to uh, to carry out the review uh, and just giving some information about the uh, the specification of of the review. But as you say, Carol, uh, it'd be important that we um, uh, that we contribute to that. So uh, uh, yeah. Uh, any question or comment uh, for Carol uh, as regards the uh, the joint committees? In which case we turn finally to the final report um, that deals with our partnership arrangements and uh, back to you Carol I think. Yes, thanks. Thanks very much. I, I sort of introduce this report and then uh, there are colleagues who are best placed better than I uh, to uh, respond on, on a number of fronts. So, for example, the Shared Services Partnership Committee, uh, Pete is our representative uh, there. So uh, if there are uh, any questions there, I know that the Shared Services uh, committee have been looking at the forward plan um, uh, and, and we'll get more detail on that in, in due course. Um, I think they only literally met in the last few days. So um, uh, the Public Service Board um, uh, has not met formally since our last meeting, but has a workshop day on uh, tomorrow. Uh, in fact, um, uh, we're well on our way to developing now the wellbeing plan um, ob objectives. So uh, important time to make sure they are uh, shaped um, uh, ready for coming back through here. It will go through to all partnership, statutory partnership um, bodies uh, to review and uh, hopefully to uh, agree and sign up to. Uh, the Paris RPB, uh, of course, Kirsty is our chair of the RPB now, um, met um, uh, just two days ago, and there are a number of elements that um, are a key focus for the RPB. Clearly, the winter pressures has been a significant issue, but also the area plan um, and uh, the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, which has really taken our health and care strategy and translated that into actions that we'll work on in partnership. That is being reviewed and uh, refreshed and reframed. Uh, so that work is uh, is underway. Uh, Kirsty may wish to to add uh, any other matter on that. And uh, just finally, then the joint uh, partnership board, the J, uh, JPB, uh, this um, is a meeting, it's a bilateral between the County Council and the Health Board. And we have agreed, as we alluded to earlier, uh, work on older people and community as the priority. Um, we are working through clearing financial disputes, which is good news. Um, and um, uh, we are very uh, clear that um, we need to work together uh, to enable sustainable uh, services into the longer term. So. Um, uh, that's the report really, Chair, and if obviously any of my other colleagues wish to come in or, or certainly respond to questions, I'm sure they'd be happy to. Thank you. Uh, Pete, anything additional from you in terms of uh, uh, shared services? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. That recently met in the last couple of days, as Carol said, so we'll get the Chair's report from that. Uh, and as stated, it was mainly focused on their IMTP, a copy which has been shared with across uh, our team to reference and link to our own IMTP. Thank you. And Kirsty, uh, RPB? Uh, forgive me, just trying to unmute myself. Uh, the RPB met this week. Uh, the main focus was to uh, agree a plan to distribute underspend in the regional investment fund uh, and that uh, underspend to support some of the winter pressures uh, that and the interventions around winter pressures that have been discussed earlier. So um, whilst that we're not in a final position to sign that off. The direction of travel was agreed and there is um, uh, additional money being made available via RIF to support some of the work that Carol outlined earlier as a joint response across voluntary sector, health and social care to the uh, difficult circumstances that we have found ourselves in over the last couple of uh, weeks and months, which I hope you hope that RIF money will be helpful. Thank you. Uh, would anyone like to come in uh, uh, with a contribution 
um, in relation to the uh, partnership arrangement report. If not, then uh, thank you uh, all very much uh, for both uh, the committee reports and the partnership arrangement reports, which I assume then, unless anyone indicates otherwise, uh, we're happy to receive and to note. Um, uh, I'm not aware of any other business, uh, uh, and so uh, we assume that the, there isn't any. The date of our next meeting is scheduled for the 29th of March, which will uh, once again be on this platform and will be held online and will be a virtual meeting. Uh, and so uh, just before I formally close uh, this meeting um, of the Health Board, we will be holding, as I indicated earlier, um, a brief uh, in-committee uh, meeting to approve the minutes of our in-committee uh, um, session that was held on the 30th of November. Uh, and the reason we're doing this is because uh, this particular item includes confidential or commercially sensitive information, which uh, is not in the public interest uh, to discuss in an open meeting such as this. And so the motion that uh, I will read out is that representatives of the press and other members of the public be excluded from the remainder of this meeting having regard to the confidential nature of the business to be transacted publicity on which will be prejudicial to the public interest um, please indicate uh, uh, um, if you don't uh, support that motion in which case that's passed and we formally close uh, this in public meeting and I will ask members to move uh, uh, seamlessly uh, or as seamlessly as we can to our brief uh, in committee session. But uh, uh, thank you all very much for all the huge amount of work uh, that goes on behind the scenes for these meetings and of course that reflects the um, the inspiring and uh, um, and very uh, effective work done by colleagues across the whole health board. Uh, much appreciated. So if we can leave this meeting and Helen, we will move uh, immediately to the in-committee meeting. That's right, isn't it? Uh, we're scheduled at 1.15, Carl, so we can either do that if people need a, a short break or we can go immediately. It's entirely up to you. My suggestion would be that we go immediately because I don't think it will be a very long meeting and uh, colleagues might might want simply to conclude everything. We can do that. We'll go immediately yeah. to the other link. OK, thank you all. Thank you.